Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Charles was preparing to receive guests. Modest get-togethers with friends were planned, which had become a weekly Friday night tradition. There was beer left in the refrigerator. Glasses and a few juice boxes were arranged on the table. A courier had just delivered five boxes of pizza, the freshest, still hot from the pizzeria on the corner. Separately, a large old fashion for the girls had been ordered. For some reason, the girls usually found pizza to be too colorful and figure damaging a food. But a lump of starch rich rice covered, stripped of fish fat, filled with creamy chicken cream or cottage cheese dinner with high fat cheese completely satisfied. And where ethically, Perhaps the young ladies believed that the more saturated fatty acids from seafood reduced the overall caloric content of this fast food. It's Japanese-inspired. The strongest advocate for sushi was, of course, Betty. She always demanded a set that included two portions of a cucumber slice and a lettuce leaf. And Charles had no idea how one could eat that nasty stuff. However, the girl herself ate a maximum of three pieces of fitness out of everything. And then she switched to Philadelphia, and he Mackey legs. But woe betide anyone who tried to make fun of her about it. Betty had a temper and a mean tongue. In addition, she had a very capricious character, which showed ten times a day. Charles tolerated her moods, realizing that if you dated the first hottie in the company, you had to put up with some inconveniences. And Betty was a beauty, stylish, elegant, temperamental, and sexy, with a gorgeous figure, long legs, and a striking impersonator and face. The subject of dreams of many guys in his entourage. The male part of the company Charles sincerely invited, and he heartily enjoyed this envy. Thanks to her, he felt himself a real macho, brutal patron of women's hearts. Although, frankly speaking, the affair with Betty was the only independent life achievement of Charles Gustman. He had nothing else to be proud of. In his 24 years, he had only managed to finish his studies in one of the commercial universities on some passable and completely useless specialty like office management or documents. He himself did not remember exactly and could not check his diploma because he had no idea where he had thrown it after receiving it and who would need that cardboard. Charles entered the institute to calm down. His mother kept saying about the necessity of higher education. He chose a faculty where he could study without straining himself and have fun at the expense of the abundance of girls. On his stream, he was the only guy and for the sake of his beautiful eyes and the slightest sign of attention. Classmates were happy to solve interim tests for him, prompted at seminars, and even prepared cheat sheets for the exam. So Charles didn't have to kill himself over his studies, much less expulsion. He was not afraid. Deferment from the army was provided to him for health reasons. Flat feet is a classic of the genre. Ever since his first visit to the enlistment office, having received his diploma, satisfied with the C's, the guy threw it in some drawer. Never took it out since, never needed it. And on his 18th birthday, his father gave him an apartment completely renovated and furnished with a fancy interior designer, but not some studio in a new building on the outskirts, and a spacious two-bedroom in a good house of the old fund. Located in the quiet center of the city, a car was planned as a graduation present, but Charles refused it. Didn't see the point. Yes, restaurants and cafes, cinemas, clubs, and shopping centers. It was more convenient for him to get there on foot, given the location of his home. For long trips, he ordered a cab or used the king of the ring to bother with the car and its maintenance, to limit himself in alcohol because of the need to get behind the wheel and spend extra money on insurance, fines, possible accidents, and other associated with car owners. The guy didn't want the hassle. Instead, he asked for a gift of a good gaming computer with a powerful video camera, cool cooling system, and a huge amount of RAM, and with all the imperial peripherals to go along with it. And this thing was much more desirable to him. Since middle school, Charles has been sick of computer games. At the first courses of the Institute, he started his own YouTube channel, 
where he regularly tried reviews of the games he had passed and records of playthroughs, kept game stories. Over time, the list of topics for stories expanded. The guy did interviews with cyber athletes and reports from competitions, filmed reviews of emergencies, the most popular games made ratings of manufacturer sites, announcements of new products commented on retrospectives, showing how developed and changed any of the games from the first to the last part, arranged video conferences with famous gamers of the world, argued about the peculiarities of clan management. This hobby required a lot of time and effort. Charles devoted all his days to it almost completely. He noticeably rocked the skills of video shooting and editing. He became a good scriptwriter and became proficient in finding hard-to-find information on the net and in libraries, and even managed to master the topic of promotion of videos and channels. In short, thanks to his hobby guy, quite professionally mastered several skills in demand on the modern labor market. But from the point of view of others, all his activities continued to look like a useless children's hobby and even a regular increase in the number of subscribers to the channel and some earnings from advertising and fans could not convince his friends and family in the opposite. They all believed that the guy is engaged in frank nonsense, but then they added, he could afford it. Yes, Charles could afford not to work and fully devote his life to his hobby. His father gave him a monthly sum equal to the average Moscow salary. Even though they lived in a relatively small provincial town, a successful businessman, owner of the largest chain of home goods stores in the region, he didn't consider it a big expense. Charles did not think much about the situation. He believed that parents were there to help their children. Custman Sr. remembered well how he himself had worked all his youth without vacations and weekends and wanted his son to be able to spend his younger years. Otherwise, he planned to support Charles for 30 years and then either involve him in the family business or put him in some warm place in the city administration. The son knew about his father's plans, but hoped that by 30 he would be famous and independent thanks to his YouTube channel and that he'd be out of the woods. But so far Charles just enjoyed life and engaged in his favorite hobby. At first, his mother periodically brainwashed him, saying that at his age it is time to find a job and cover his expenses independently. That Charles got a job as a specialist in a small advertising agency in the capital. The job took him about six o'clock a week. It could be done remotely. And the guys were completely happy with that. Paid there, however, about 10 times less than he received monthly from his father. But the mother calmed down and stopped acting on the son's nerves, which was the whole point of the whole thing. The company in which Charles hung out, from which he regularly met on Fridays, was about the same circle with him. Children of wealthy parents, big businessmen, officials, lawyers, developers, investors, all of them had known each other since childhood. They had practically the same opportunities to start and most of the buddies took advantage of them, only good education, often abroad stable work in large companies not bad for their age physicians, steep salaries. That's what life looked like for most of the guys in Gustman's and Turridge. Girls, of course, mostly played the role of socialites. Some tried their hand at modeling. Some tried to become a singer or an actress or a fashion blogger, and some just stoked their parents' money for endless clothes, partying, and traveling. But there were a few young ladies who were educated in their field of interest and worked in their specialty, albeit with varying success. Only Adriana stood out from the general mass. A girl from an ordinary working family is now a bohemian artist and a sought-after digital designer. She got into the company by accident, with one of the guys. The guy who brought her has long since disappeared somewhere in the vastness of Europe and stopped contacting her and Adriana stayed and didn't look like a poor relative at all. In general, most of the guys and even girls from Charles' party already had some achievements of their own clear reasons for pride. But nevertheless, Gustman's buddies did not consider him an outsider. Each of them had also been educated on their parents' money. Thanks to them, he solved problems with the army and housing, a car, and sometimes a job. Almost everyone's parents periodically planted different sums of money for vacations or to upgrade the car or just to live. 
so it didn't bother his friends at all that Charles, in fact, lived on his father's handouts. It was the norm among them. But they didn't take him seriously either. Rather, they treated him as a teenager stuck in his childhood. There was another avid gamer in the company, Charles Guthrie, but he was treated very differently by the crowd, perhaps because he successfully combined his hobby with his work in his father's bank, or maybe because Charles was an official member of the regional cyber sports team. He was well known and respected in this field and regularly participated in cool competitions and won big cash prizes. Charles didn't know the reasons why, but he felt it. Charles perceived as being the same age as his Charles as a younger brother, and even his affair with Betty had not brought him to the level of an adult in the eyes of the company, although it did add a couple or three points to his personal ranking. Well, that's okay. Betty, though sometimes a tiresome beauty, was also good in bed, so Charles considered himself a winner, and he would get serious about himself when he would bring his channel to the top and earn large sums on it steadily. The guy was sure that it would happen in the near future. The guests gathered gradually. Guthrie came one of the first and from the threshold greeted with a welcoming wave of surveillance. Top secret information. Solemnly, he pronounced it all not to be leaked. These are training records. There are a few chips that we are still practicing. We plan to use them at the next championship. We'll make them public. I'm not going to blow my head off, but it's good for you to familiarize yourself with." Charles appreciated the gift on the flash drive. There were recordings of raids in one game, which he himself was not too interested in, but the viewers of the channel liked it. The guy was going to make a small story on it, but he didn't want to go through the levels himself, and from the shop on the video is quite possible to cut suitable footage, as well as to look more closely at the details of the world map appearance, equipment of characters, and some other features. Gustman connected the flash drive to the computer and dragged Charles to the kitchen, where a video camera, foreign lighting, was already installed. He and his buddy had arranged a short interview beforehand. They had discussed the script, written out the questions and answers. Now all that remained was to shoot the material. Charles seated Kowalski in a chair in front of a low table. He sat down opposite, turned on the camera from the remote control, and began cheerfully, looking into the lens. Greetings, dear subscribers. Today my channel is hosting a famous cyber athlete, winner of several regional and federal tournaments Charles Guthrie. Those who closely follow the world of cyber sports, this name is certainly already known. So now you have the opportunity to get to know the master of the show morning. Thanks to careful preliminary preparation, the shooting took only about 40 minutes. When Charles and Charles returned to the living room, almost the entire company was already there. Only Betty was missing. But that was familiar. In her own sense of good manners, she believed that girls were not only allowed to be late, but even expected to be late. However, the girl showed up just five minutes after the interview was over. Charles thought he was lucky. Having come a little earlier, he could not avoid a slight offense, and maybe even a small scandal because of the fact that he was doing all sorts of silly things, and not meet his beauty at the doorstep. Presently the beauty flashed into the antechamber. Shining smile, tenderly kissed her bow, and right hand languidly missed me. I have a surprise. Betty stepped aside from behind her back, and a girl unfamiliar to Charles appeared. Please love and welcome. My third cousin Kathy proclaimed the hottie. The bank's here. Don't be shy. They're all here. This is Charles. I told you about him. He's wonderful. Nice to meet you, Kathy said. A little embarrassed, she extended her hand to Charles. The guy shook it surprised by the lack of manicure, or rather decor and varnish on the short nails. And in general Kathy looked unaccustomed dressed modestly, not even a mass market, but a station market. Shoes on her feet from the category of cheap, but good. They look more like old sewing boots than the shoes of a young girl. The hair is a natural color of red. Her panties are gathered in a heavy knot at the back of her head. They are loose around the shoulders, like all the girls this summer have on their faces makeup, 
clearly applied by Betty's skillful hand and also clearly unaccustomed and uncomfortable for Kathy herself. But the smile is a good one, sincere, open, gentle. The girls in their circle are usually Instagram smiles. That is, beautiful photos of genius, not too natural. Mimicry works off the smile, all 32 teeth, but the eyes more often than not remain empty and different. Kathy's eyes, on the contrary, are warm and filled with light. Though the tips of her lips are just about to lift. A second cousin, ha. Huh? Yes. Wow. Meanwhile, Betty introduced Kathy to everyone here. She called them all by name, gave them a brief description, and considered her duty done. She took Charles out to the balcony for a smoke, and the two glass doors to the room closed as the friendly expressions on his face disappeared. Imposing it on me the best, she complained irritably. To get in, she came from some backwoods, from where the mothers on the doe are born there. And it would be all right just recommended at our house for the time of the admission campaign dumped in the dorm. So no, mom decided that the guest must be entertained and educated. And who's supposed to do that? Of course, you're the same age as me, You'll find a common language, Betty said. She's mimicking her mother's voice. What common ground? She's as dumb as a cork and has no sense of direction in a restaurant. She doesn't know what to order and freaks out about prices of the mall. She doesn't need anything. At the club, she is loud and has a headache. Asked where she wants to go, she says to a museum. I'm like a fool. Three days on the rights of the hostess dragged with her then on the paintings galleries, then the local history, then Prickeny on the Museum of Optical Business and Botanical. That's what I forgot there. And it all considers at each showcase for half an hour hangs that something pictures. Pestering the guide with questions is a total waste of time. She's your age. Charles wondered. Isn't it a little late for her to enter? Lesjinka went to medical school for three years after school. Then she worked as a nurse in a hospital. Now she's decided to go to university to become a real doctor. She dreams of saving people's lives. You see, that's all she talks about all day long. The girl giggled at the work of doctors. She was clearly not the best opinion. And how long did you have to deal with her? Charles asked sympathetically and two more days Friday will be the results of the appointment. On Saturday, she'll be off to her village, and I wouldn't even be able to stay at your place tonight because of her. Bell sighed. You'll have to escort the guests home and make sure she gets there safely, as if anyone needs her. Too bad, sighed the boy. But you come back Saturday. How will you see your sister off? It's a deal. I'll try my best to make it to that bright day. Patiently discouraged said Betty, Charles himself. The unexpected guest did not cause much trouble. She sat quietly in a corner of the sofa, gazed at the company, listened to the conversations, but did not meet in them herself. As her host, the guy poured her a juice. He brought a slice of pizza, offered some other treats, and even for a while maintained a light conversation about nothing. But the girl quickly bored him. And Charles, having apologized, was distracted by other guests. Soon he noticed that Kathy was talking to Adriana with interest, and the conversation was clearly engaging both girls. Proletarians of all countries, unite. Betty, the technologist, also noticed the couple. It's true what they say. People of the same background are subconsciously attracted to each other. It's easier for you, he shrugged. You don't have to worry about the girl being bored. You can mind your own business. Well. I was worried about Milo Sevic. Vina hummed and hooted. Betty and Kathy were leaving before all the guests. I'm sorry, honey, the girl said. Hugging Charles goodbye, I have to go. I promised to get Kathy home no later than midnight, but you and I will catch up. And I promise you'll miss me. You don't have to leave, Kathy spoke up. You can just put me in a cab and give me the address. I can't drive myself, can I? That's what we'll do. Charles got excited. No, 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 Betty spluttered. As a hostess, I can't leave a guest to his fate. It's simply unseemly. She kissed Charles passionately, waved goodbye to the remaining guests, 
and taking her sister under her arm, she staggered off into the night. But getting into the cab, she turned to Kathy and said angrily, What's that? And you've been carried away, playing the noble game. I'll drive myself, just put me in the cab. I didn't want to disturb your plans. Cousin was embarrassed. I have plans tonight at 1 o'clock a.m. I have a drunken giraffe date with a cute boy. If it weren't for you, I'd have to make up an excuse to avoid this house party. And everything was going so well. And you had to step in. Good thing I was able to distract Charles from that thought. Wait, Kathy said confused. Goodbye. But isn't Charles your boyfriend? Charles is my future husband. I hope at least the income of his family suits me. And he has the right character, peaceful, trusting. They wouldn't think of prying into my life, monitoring and controlling me. He's ready to forget about everything with his toys. You know, they say the ideal husband is one who doesn't interfere with your life. I found one. The main thing is to bring him to the registry office. But that doesn't mean I have to deprive myself of my usual pleasures in the process. And here you are. I'm sorry, Kathy said conciliatory. It hadn't occurred to me. Don't tell me about morality and love marriages, Betty said. It's all nonsense for the poor. Something, her cousin reassured her. I wasn't going to. I added to myself it was useless anyway. For some reason I felt sorry for Charles, who was almost a stranger to her. September was dry and warm. The weather had been almost summer-like all month, and so Charles, about to leave the house, only snorted derisively at the weatherman's forecast of possible rain. What rain? What are you talking about? He threw on a light shirt over his t-shirt, picked up his backpack with equipment for shooting, and hurried to meet the cab that came to him. He had to go to the other end of the city, to one of the outskirts of the working regions. The guy hated such places, but today he had no choice. Today Charles had arranged an interview with the youngest cyber athlete in the city, a 13-year-old boy. Despite his age, the boy was a member of the city's famous team of gamers and was known and respected in the gaming community more than once. It was his actions that brought the team the prizes, and in general, having communicated with his hero at several competitions and in the network of the game, I was convinced that the boy seriously understands his game world and can easily shove any older player behind the belt. The kid was definitely worthy of an interview, but due to his age he could not come to visit the interviewer or meet him. Somewhere in the center of the city it was necessary to make arrangements with his parents to accompany him, to choose a time, to make long and tedious schedules. Charles decided that it would be easier to visit the boy himself. Especially he suspected that in the presence of his parents the kid would not be frank and relaxed enough in front of the camera. An hour after leaving home, he disembarked from the cab at the entrance of the young gay world and called him. I'll be right down, the boy said into the phone. And a few minutes later, he did indeed appear from the front door. His parents wouldn't let him rent an apartment. He said, a little embarrassed. Well, like, it's not a fresh mess. Why embarrass yourself in front of people? But I'm home for the money. They're lying grandmothers. We can even set up somewhere in the yard. Such a substitution promised Charles additional complications. He counted on shooting indoors, so he took the lenses with him with such a calculation and light to reflect, or for some reason dragged spare batteries for the camera. I didn't realize I'd have to do something about it. Okay, well, let's give it a shot. You and I need a flat area with some benches to put you on, so it's shady but not too dark. And no people walking around. They'll get in the way. While they found a place, while they set up the camera, took a few shots, while they filmed the conversation itself. Four hours passed, although Charles and discussed plans for an interview with his hero. But still the preparation was not as serious as, for example, with Charles Guthrie. Therefore, some of the lines, or even the whole answers had to be shot from several takes, from several angles. Sometimes the boy would get too involved in a topic. Charles had to wait for the end of his arguments while praying that the batteries of the camera would not die. After the conversation was over, 
Gustman asked the boy to take him around the yard and the neighboring streets to show him the school he was attending and the way to it. He wanted to get some shots of the surroundings for the story's opening and ending. The walk took another hour and a half, and in the process, I felt very hungry and slightly cold. It got noticeably colder outside. Clouds gathered, and the wind blew. It seemed that the forecasters had not lied about the forecast. Having parted with his interlocutor, Gustman decided to look for a cafe or a canteen in the area to have a little snack, and it was better to call a cab to a place whose address you knew exactly. There were no numbers or street signs on many of the houses in the neighborhood. Charles moved toward Center Street. He expected to find a more or less decent establishment there. But no sooner had he gone a few hundred meters than the promised downpour came from the sky. Strong, dense with large drops, it instantly blotted out the guy's light windbreaker. Ten seconds and Charles seemed wet through and through, right down to his underwear and socks. Gustman looked around for some shelter and was lucky enough to see the sign of a Pietorochka through the rain. Huge leaps, carefully covering his backpack with equipment. He rushed toward the store and ducked into its vestibule with relief. It became clear that Charles was not the only one who had thought of sheltering from the rain behind the supermarket doors. The vestibule was packed with locals, and the guy didn't want to jostle among them. Andrew was in the trading hall, but after a couple of minutes he began to shiver from the cold, which smelled from open showcases with milk, with cheese and sausage. Wet, cold, hungry. Charles was angry at the world, and his anger only intensified. After several attempts to call a cab failed. There were no free cars, no one wanted to go out in such bad weather, to beat someone up. Now Gustman fought gloomily. And then he was called out. Charles, it's you. He turned around and saw a young girl in homemade plate pants and a stretched t-shirt near the cash register. Her face was vaguely familiar. But that's where only polite conversations with strangers came from. And that's all he needed right now. You don't remember me. It was affirmative. Meanwhile, I'm Betty's sister. She brought me to visit you at the beginning of the summer. And where are you from? Betty's sister is a hillbilly glushko who came to apply to medical school. A quiet gray mouse who sat in the corner all night and answered every phrase out of turn. Why are you bothering with me? I'm here on business, Charles explained. It's short. I'm worried about the rain. You're soaking wet. You could catch a cold. Not for long. Suddenly, the gray mouse got excited. Let's go to my place. I live in this house. If you let me take your clothes, I'll feed you lunch, just when it's raining. Gustman wanted to refuse, but the argument of winning outweighed everything else. There was no ready food at home anyway. It would be necessary to order and wait for delivery, and also to get to this house. He drove almost an hour back through puddles and evening traffic. It would be an hour and a half. And he didn't even eat breakfast today. I've been running around the yards with my camera all day. Lunch is tempting, he said honestly, looking at Kathy. Well, that's fine. Go on then, she said cheerfully, but at the same time went not at all to the exit of the store, but somewhere in the depths, not understanding anything. The guy followed her at the service exit from the sales floor. The gray mouse slowed down, waved to someone. Svetochka let us out affectionately she said, approached the girl to the administrator. It's scary to go outside now. Together with the administrator, they entered the service entrance, went through some sort of warehouse, and found themselves near a large metal door. The employee opened it with her key and Kathy goodbye. Baitov. Thank you. Immediately, she ducked behind her arm and pulled Charles behind her. A step and the guy found himself in the most ordinary entranceway of the most ordinary Khrushchevka. Yeah, yeah. Fun, asked Larissa. I this move almost immediately after moving to classified. Now I use it. If I don't feel like going outside. How was today? The main thing is to get to know everyone and remember who works on what day. How do you get there? Gustman's interested. You knock on the door. I call the cell phone of today's shift, and they open, the girl explained, 
climbing the stairs. Sometimes you have to wait a bit, but in the evening it's better than going through the yard. It's darker to walk through and safer. Kathy's apartment was on the third floor and looked like a standard grandmother of books. Narishkin nado bills on the floor, a bulky wall in the great room, a chandelier with pseudo-crystal pendants, a rug on the wall, renovations from 20 years ago. Given the neighborhood of housing in this condition, should have been rented very cheap, that only people are not willing to tolerate, just so as not to live in a dorm. Although perhaps Kathy finds this barrier quite normal. She hadn't seen many others, Charles thought. The girl had disappeared into the bedroom and returned, carrying a large towel and a terry robe. Bright yellow, lilac floral. I'm sorry, I don't have any men's clothes, and you'll feel better in a robe now. You'll agree quicker, she said, smiling a little embarrassed. Go to the bathroom, change your clothes, hanging on the towel. Resident, he is electric. I'll turn it on now. In an hour, everything will be dry by now. With shoes, we just have to figure something out. You've had it in your typical grandmother. You've had your revenge. But Charles was the least of your worries. Clean and mold-free. That's fine. He gladly pulled off his wet clothes and hung them over the snake's eyelids. Surprisingly, this appliance was a new modern one, even with temperature control. I wonder who went broke the landlord or Kathy herself. Thinking for a bit, the guy let the hot water run and climbed under the shower with a stream of hot water. Quickly burned through, skin bleeding the elderly. After about 15 minutes we think, forgot about the recent snob talk with pleasure confused Howell, chuckling to himself, got back into his terry cloth robe and headed for the kitchen, planning to grab a bite of some kind of sandwich and head home. It was unlikely that a girl living alone would have proper food, reasoned at most some mittens, salads, diet bread. At least that was the way things were at Betty's place. To his surprise, on the kitchen table was set almost a full meal, salad of fresh vegetables, mashed potatoes with appetizing cutlets, bread in beautiful wicker baskets, sliced cheese, and sausage on a neat saucer and a mug of hot coffee. Good for you for guessing and not being shy, Kathy complimented him. Sit down, everything's ready. It's still raining, so we can eat slowly and properly. I never thought I'd end up almost in a restaurant. Charles grinned. This looks delicious. I thought girls didn't cook for themselves. He continued with his mouth full, taking it for a cutlet. But who does? I like to eat, that's why I cook. The hostess shrugged her shoulders and you're not afraid of your figure?" asked the guy. Not a bit. I have to run so much to study and work, that to get fat just no chance. We are lucky with genetics, in our family all skinny. So you did get in. How's it going for you? Gustman said. He was not interested, but the politeness of the guest obliged to keep the conversation going. Interesting. Really? said Kathy. Tough but I'm glad I didn't take the concessionary one. After college, you could have skipped the first year, but I thought the school was a few years ago. I could forget a lot of things, and it turned out, indeed, some subjects have to be repeated almost from scratch. How did you work if you forgot everything? That's what nurses are like nowadays. They don't know anything. But at work, most of the theoretical subjects and did not need, objected the girl, not offended. Well, the same Latin, for example, or anatomy so in-depth as a doctor, a nurse does not need to know it. Come on, you're not interested. Why don't you tell me about yourself? What do you do? Where do you work? I don't know much about you. You're a guy, my sister Olia told me. Your work has something to do with videotaping. You're a cameraman on TV. I guess. No, laughed Gusman. I have nothing to do with television, so if you wanted to become a star with my help, I can't help you. I'm certainly not interested in your world fame," smiled Kathy in response. What are you filming then? I have my own YouTube channel, Charles said proudly. I make videos for it. He gazed into the girl's face, 
but saw no admiration or curiosity in it that new acquaintances usually showed at the mention of earning money from videos or glasses. Below the muzzle expressed only restrained interest and polite homeowner to the words of the interlocutor. And bluntly, it is such a sight on the internet. There you can make as if your own page and publish on it videos. Decided to explain in the video blog, the more people will watch them, the more you cite will pay you for advertising, which he inserts in these clips. But I'm not that dark, laughed Kathy. Believe me, the villagers know exactly what the internet and YouTube are all about. I use it regularly. By the way, there are plenty of good educational videos on my topic there too. And so do my parents. My dad watches about animal husbandry, and my mom looks for interesting recipes. What is your channel devoted to? Computer games. Charles asked glumly and looked outside the window. It looks like a downpour. We can check our clothes and get out of here. Even if things didn't get the hell out of here, you're home. He was already reluctant to hang out with a lesbian. And now he didn't want to listen to her nonsense at all. Look, she's trying to hurt him. The internet won't help the villagers. All their interests will forever remain in cattle farming for a winter skating rink. Well, it's not that popular, Kathy said, but it's quite popular. My younger brother is always watching reviews and walkthroughs and playing it himself. And our neighbor is a field woman. She plays solitaire. Or has she switched from literature? Charles realized he was being rude, but could do nothing about the irritation building up inside. His peers usually reacted differently when they heard about his bloggers. They showed interest, admired him, asked him about his earnings, looked at him with curiosity, asked him questions about the filming process, about the games themselves, about the cyber sports industry. And this is gay better, it seems. Takes his occupation as something self-evident and banal. And the fact that we'll talk to the blogger, a thousandth and stories, which daily awaits many subscribers from around the world. It does not hurt a bit. Some other grandmother. Solitaire. Kerchief. It's her part-time job. She wins there some equipment, but virtual in the sense of enemy tanks, probably, and then sells and buys them, presenting painted tanks to play with them later. Although it probably doesn't surprise you, since you communicate in this sphere, it's only strange to me. Babafield says that so almost earns a second pension, and even more than one. She also plays some other game. I don't know the name, but she said she downloads characters for other players for money. It's probably something about the Orient. Charles took a while to digest the information. After that, he peppered the rubber band with questions about his roommate. How old, who does she live with? How long has she been playing games? How do people around her feel? What does she play on? The guy had already realized that it would be a good idea to make a story about such a wonderful grandmother. He'd go right after the video he made today. The youngest cyber athlete against the oldest gamer subscribers would be thrilled. Kathy honestly tried to answer, but as it turned out, she didn't know much. Eventually, the girl gave up. Look, she said to you it is easier to go to our village and talk on the field yourself. She might be willing to do an interview for your channel. I'm going this weekend. In two days. Let's go together. Charles agreed. After a brief discussion of the trip plan, the guy started to head home. The downpour had already subsided, lunch had been eaten, and Charles' clothes and even his sneakers were surprisingly completely dry. Gustman hailed a cab and promised Kathy that he would pick her up Saturday morning. Kathy explained something about electric trains, but the idea was uninspiring. What was the last thing he wanted was to be stuck in a cold, dirty carriage amongst the country folk and villagers. He rented a nice SUV for the weekend, on which he could get to the village quickly, from comfort, and in case of anything to leave there as soon as he finished shooting. There was no need to linger in the shithole, because the public commuter transportation schedule didn't suit you. The two days leading up to the trip were a hassle. Gustman was editing footage of a young cyber athlete, recorded the passage of one of the levels in a strategy game, hosted a stream for his subscribers, met Betty. In short, I was busy almost around the clock. 
thinking up a story about the grandmother he'd made the trip for. The guy didn't have time, but he hoped to do it on the road. Betty to his absence on the weekend treated as usual, capricious, offended and long-lasted because of the fact that the groom exchanges two free days with her for some village old woman. But by the end of the evening, she graciously forgave Charles and promised that she would miss him very much. For some reason, Gustman did not tell the bride that he was going to her relatives and one of them together. He parked at the house at six o'clock, as agreed. Kathy was already waiting at the entrance together with two volumes and bags. I've packed some goodies and some unseasonal things I need to take home and store there, she explained. Why? You'll need it again next season. You could just put them in your closet, you have a lot of them. Almost all the closets there are occupied by the owner's things. I don't even know if I'll be living here next season. It's a relative's apartment. He inherited it from his mom and kind of doesn't need it. It's weird, yeah. So many people struggle for years to have their own corner, deny themselves everything, get into mortgages. And here a man got free housing, and he doesn't need it, and it's even a burden. I say indefinitely hummed and shrugged my shoulders. A world where people deny themselves everything to get a roof over their heads was a guy, to put it mildly, far from. But he let me in while he lived, to keep an eye on the place. It's a rough neighborhood, you know. It wouldn't be good if the apartment was empty, Kathy continued. He'll decide what he wants to do with it. Maybe he'll sell it in a couple months or renovate it and rent it out. Then I'll move into a dorm. I can't afford it on my own. Oh, I see. Listen, Kathy, I'm sorry, but I won't be able to entertain you with conversation during the trip. Not at Gustman. You don't like to be distracted while driving. The girl asked understandingly. Well, I'll read for now. She took out a thick book from her bag, wrapped the paper around it, and delved into it with visible interest. Charles was surprised that the girl was not at all offended by his veiled requests to be quiet. Betty would have been in her place. It was scary to think about. First, she would have kept quiet for a while. Then she would have tried to make conversation about something else. And then she would have pouted because Charles didn't respond to her words. Then she would have made a scandal right there in the car. Despite the fact that a man behind the wheel shouldn't be distracted and nervous, maybe Kathy was only quiet for a while. But no, it turned out that the girl is quite capable of occupying herself for the duration of the trip and the reluctance of her acquaintance to be distracted from the road was taken seriously. She read, sometimes taking a break from the book and looking thoughtfully out of the window. Occasionally she made some notes, but she didn't bother to talk. This is going to be perfect, Charles thought. In the blissful silence of the car, he had time to think over the script of the future video in relative detail, to make a list of additional questions for the interview, to estimate what shots and plans should be made to emphasize more vividly the rural origin of his future heroine. Only when the SUV drove into the village, Gustman distracted from reading, asking to show the way to the house. The girl is quite sensible, and in time prompted the right turns. For what Charles I even had a little respect. After a beautiful good leaf fence, behind which a well-groomed rider could be seen, the boy slowed down in a cheerful mood. And when he and Kathy passed into the station, his spirits soared. Almost at the gate waited a round milestone, height and a boy of about twelve years old, peering curiously at the lush guests. Wow, this is real. Gamer Kathy, where did you get it? The kid said, hearing his YouTube nickname. Charles smiled, noticing the delight and admiration in the kid's eyes. He suddenly felt like a budding rock star. Having met a devoted fan on the outskirts of the world. This is Charles, Oleg's fiance. Remember her? Ask Kathy's brother. Wow. So he's also related to us. Guys, you're crazy exclaimed the boy and turned to the guest. And you, you'll be with us for a long time. I'll call the guys. We watch your channel all the time. You have a cool breakdown of strategy and passages are useful. Tell us how you did at that castle. That kid started spouting off game names, terms unfamiliar to Kathy, 
but seemingly understandable to Charles and me. William, she interrupted her brother, laughing. Let the man rest and eat his breakfast. You'll have time to hang around. A voice came from the side of the house. A stately middle-aged woman was approaching them on the path. Apparently, Kathy and William's mother has lost all peace since you called, and when she heard you were coming as a guest, she almost spent the night. He's been on the porch looking all over you and knocking all his buddies off their feet, she added. With a chuckle, they argued really with him on the same blogger will come or confused and something. Passing the use. This is my mom, Aunt Jenna. This is William, my brother. We'll have tea after breakfast, then we'll get down to business. After breakfast, Charles surrounded William buddies. The crowd will snap at 12, 14 years old. More than two o'clock passed in conversation and questioning, but for Gustman they flew by unnoticed. He was proud and pleased with his sudden popularity, even though it had caught up with him here on the edge of the world, as he put it to himself. His adult peers were interested in his bloggers, but their interest was more restrained and focused more on the aspect of earning money from videos. Boys admired his work sincerely and fervently and asked more questions about games, features of their passage game worlds. In short, just about what occupied the guy himself. The conversation with the boys took Charles seriously. It lasted until almost noon and would have lasted even longer if Kathy, who had left the house, had not asked the internet star with a sneer, have you forgotten why you came to see us? Gusman snapped, indeed, time is running out, and here he is playing superstar. To his happiness, young fans were happy with the news that their idol came to interview Baba Poli. The guys immediately recommended her in the best possible way. They decided with glee that they should have made a story about her a long time ago and sent Charles to the neighbor to get acquainted and agree on filming. He wanted to take one of the adults as a chaperone, but to his surprise, both Kathy and Aunt Jenna refused. With a support group like that, you'll have an easier time convincing Baba Paul, Kathy said, nodding at the boys. She was used to her neighbors thinking. She was out of her mind for her fondness for a little teasing. We don't do that, of course, but she dislikes everyone just in case. She's on the same page with the boys. That's how it turned out in the end. Paula turned out to be just a plain old lady with nothing to show for it. But Charles watched her talking to the boys about their common hobby, and he realized the old lady could really put a lot of gamers under her belt. Upon seeing her gaming computer, the boy whistled in admiration, and learning that in one of the games she is not just an ordinary participant and the head of the clan, naturally respected the 78-year-old woman and confirmed his desire to shoot an interview with her. The grandmother knew about his channel, but treated it with less enthusiasm than William and his comrades. However, under the pressure of requests and persuasion, the company of boys did agree to the story with their participation. Charles by this time had already realized that the script he had come up with was no good. He planned to show a remote village and an old not powerful grandmother stove, who can hardly move around the vegetable garden and yard but in the virtual world is reincarnated into a strong, dexterous warrior, the protector of the magical world. The village, according to his idea, was supposed to turn out gray and shabby. The grandmother is out of the game world, miserable and lonely. But during the conversation with young fans and with Wendy himself, the guy realized that such a video would be just blatant disrespect for these people. The concept had to be changed literally on the fly. To his luck, the woman of the field said that she would be ready to shoot only tomorrow. At least useful, we need to clean up the house a little, she explained, so as not to inadvertently embarrass the whole network. Charles ran through the list of questions with her, had a preparatory conversation. The rest of the day, as long as the light outside allowed, filmed his heroine's backyard, the street she lives on, general plans of the village home he and Dimka, who accompanied his idol in his adventures, returned to the very dinner. At the table Charles met Kathy's father. He had a drink with him, thanked him for the shelter, told him a little about Betty and her parents. Relatives, after all. After dinner we had a bath with a steam room and fresh brooms, 
an obligatory entertainment for city guests. Exhausted by the events and impressions, Charles barely crawled to the room he had been assigned and collapsed on the bed. Fresh sheets, soft feather bed, airy lush pillow, the intoxicating smell of clean linen dried in the sun, which no laundry conditioner could duplicate. It all suddenly seemed so cozy and homey to the guy. Suddenly, he thought that he should make friends with Kathy and her family, if only to pick a roommate once in a while, to relax and clear his head. And what a backwoods village it was. No mud, no ramshackle huts, and the inhabitants are quite civilized. What's one grandmother of the field worth? 78 years old, like a balloon in computer and modern games. Charles tried to think again about tomorrow's shooting, but fatigued by impressions and unusual for him load. Walking Bono quickly became confused in his thoughts, and he was also very thirsty. He should have brought a mug of water or kvass with him to his room. After all, the offer was to bake iron. He refused. Now he would have to get out of bed and find the kitchen in the dark, unfamiliar house. Charles sighed reluctantly, got out of bed, and looked out the door. The house was dark, and everyone seemed to be asleep. No, there was a light on the veranda, and there were soft female voices coming from it. No other way. Mom and daughter are resting after the bath. The boy thought and headed in that direction, hoping to ask the women for water so that he wouldn't have to wander around the house. He walked quietly so as not to wake up the rest of the household and reached the sacred space later, when he suddenly froze on the spot. A scrap of conversation reached him. You're too protective of him. Aunt Jenna spoke cheerfully. Not like a hostess of guests. Hasn't she fallen in love? No, Mom. Alice's voice answered in the woman's tone. I just feel sorry for him. He seems like a nice guy, kind and enthusiastic. Alex is spinning him as she wants from him runs on a date to some guys, with whom she meets through the internet just to fuck. It's true, when I was staying with them, she never spent 13 o'clock at home. And every time she bragged to me about the hot guy she was going to see tonight, she'd show me pictures. She never said a kind word about the games, but when she's with him, she's such an affectionate bunny. My favorite, my favorite, my poozy poozy poozy. It's all she's got to play for. She could have gone out with her co-workers. Why keep it to yourself? Couldn't he have found a better one? She says she is satisfied with the income of his family, and as a husband, he is quite useful to her, because he is so busy with his toys that her life will not interfere. Imagine how I felt hearing that, especially after I met Charles. I first thought he was just as cynical, rude, and then I watched him as well when she introduced us, and also after that, and today, and felt so sorry for him. Like you know, an abandoned puppy. Gusman, stunned by what he had heard, carefully stepped back into the corridor. He had already forgotten his thirst. He crept quietly back into the room and banged the door awkwardly against the jam, but did not pay any attention to it. He sat down on the bed and lowered his face into his palms. What shame. How vile, how nasty to find out such a thing. So Betty twists his tail and is not the least bit embarrassed about it, and even brags about his adventures. And to who? In front of her wiretapping sister, who can hardly keep her mouth shut. And only in front of her. Suddenly her stalling is already known by their entire company. And only Charles is still unaware of the length of his horns. Suddenly everyone's been laughing at him for a long time, or pitying him in secret like an abandoned puppy man. And the comparison should be humbling, but it's actually shameful. No, Charles did not feel the despair of a betrayed Betty in love. He was not in love for a minute, though he sincerely admired the girl's beauty and sexuality. He felt only resentment and anger. Look how for a chump he keeps his family income suits her and wants to make a husband out of him, who will support and not interfere. What a bitch. I've got to do it now. Right now. Right now. Tell her to go to hell. Don't find out. Don't ask. Don't accuse. Don't make excuses. Just send her to hell. And so that she would understand how much he despised her, how much he hated her, 
and would not try to object or apologize or start a scandal. By the way, how could he even tolerate her poise and scandalousness for so long? Were the big tits really that much of an eyesore? Charles dialed, was Betty's number, but heard only the answering machine message. Writing to one of the messengers seemed like a bad idea to convey all his emotions. Texting alone wouldn't do it. But a video message to the ladies it would be best in front of the camera. He would be able to express anything by tone of voice, facial expression, pose, angle. It's a habit. And send that recording to Telegram. She uses it most of the time. She'll see it. She won't say she didn't look at it. She won't say no. Charles opened the laptop that was on the table, adjusted the lighting angle, set the table so that the picture would turn out as he planned with the right light and the right background. Finally, the guy sat down in front of, but morning turned on the video recording program. But no sooner had he begun his address to the door. The rooms fell away and she walked in. Vanessa looked closely at the face. Guest closed the door behind her and said a little guiltily, you overheard me and mom, didn't you? Why would you say that? Asked Gustman. Angrily, I heard the door slam. And I can tell by the way you look. You've got that look on your face right now. A face, Charles thought grudgingly. Not unlike that of an abandoned puppy. What would she know, that girl? I lured her to my place. She flapped her eyes at me, then texted me all weekend. She could have told me about her sister. She could have. Why didn't you tell me if you were so decent, and now you feel sorry for me? You see, I'll show you an abandoned puppy, and I'll show your sister that she's not the only one who can sleep around and lie to your face. But of course he didn't say all that out loud, just shrugged his shoulders as indifferently as possible. It's a normal face, don't make it up, and get out of here. He rose from the chair, pulled Kathy by the arm, pulling her away from the bed door drew her to him, hugged her firmly, kissed her as he kisses the most desirable lovers, and feeling the girl's reciprocal movement, he smoothly lowered her onto the bed about the switched-on camera, which stood in front of the laptop until the morning. Charles never remembered. The first thing Adriana dragged a decrepit Viennese table from the bedroom. She stopped it near the kitchen table and climbed into the seat with her legs, for some reason, out of all the furniture in the apartment, the artist preferred this old man of Zenith production, and to use more stable and strong stools refused flatly. The girls had been talking to each other for several months since that party at Charles's in early summer. Then they got to talking, found in each other a lot of common interests, sense of humor, views on life. They exchanged phone numbers and became buddies, most often, Adriana met Kathy after university, and if she had a free evening, led her to some bohemian event. But she visited her new friend at least once a week, but she did not invite her to her place, referring to the difficulties with her parents, with whom she still had to share an apartment. Usually meetings were planned in advance, but yesterday Adriana had called and stated unhesitatingly that she needed to talk urgently. What time tomorrow is free? And now at seven o'clock the artist was already taking a cup of hot coffee from the poured leaves. The hostess moved her friend Sugar and looked at her questioningly. Come on, tell me, she said, with difficulty suppressing it, what is your fire? I hypothesized Adriana. And to be sure, you have your hands up to the sky. The pent-up frustration of female curiosity. And only you can save me. And how interested? Asked Kathy. You tell me. What happened between your sister and Charles? What happened between them? Don't you know? Adriana blurted out incredulously, texting Betty something like we're breaking up. I'll bring your stuff back Monday at six o'clock. And then he was out of range. And then on Monday, he brought a box. You know what's in it? Shampoos and makeup and combs. The kind of stuff that girls leave with guys who sleep over. I didn't even go into the apartment, I just handed it to her across the threshold. She didn't take it, started to ask him what happened, so he just silently put this box by the door outside the window on her, so on Betty, and he turned around and walked away. And he hasn't picked up the phone or returned her texts since. 
You know a lot more than I do. Where did you get those details, by the way? Kathy smiled. I was there, the artist explained. I was just visiting Betty's father. We're supposed to sponsor a new exhibition. We were talking details. I was about to leave, and in the hallway I caught this scene. The box went into a corner, the hallway bumped. The door slammed, and she ran off to her room sobbing. I wanted to comfort her and find out what was wrong, but she kicked me out. The girls tried to talk to her, but they only found out about the message, about what and where now. She can't get anything from him at all. He just says he's busy editing. He's not in time. So I thought you might know something. How would Kathy shrug? We didn't write that we weren't communicating. I did let her know when I moved to town. She said, Oak, we should meet somewhere. That's all. And Charles. What about Charles? Adriana was immediately interested. Nothing, really. We met by chance a couple of weeks ago and chatted. Then he came to our village, filmed a story about our neighbor, stayed with us, and that was it. It's about Gamer's grandmother. Look, fire, I just love her. I wish I could keep the same intellectual activity, interest in new things at her age, my friend said enviously. I reviewed the story several times, and even Donatello to her, Kathy clarified. Not Charles. No. Charles inserted her phone number at the end of the video and said that Wendy's fellow villagers were skeptical of her hobby, like you can text her with words of encouragement and approval. It'll make her feel good. Well, you must have seen it yourself. I checked the card on the phone. So I sent her a transfer with the words of encouragement. It's a little 1000, but I think she'll be pleased. That's cool. Vanessa said it sincerely. You're good. Should I? Should I watch the video too? It's a neighbor after all. Look, it works out that way. The breakup messages were sent because of your trip. You didn't notice anything strange about him at the time. Maybe something happened. Maybe he was acting unusual. I don't know how he normally acts. I've seen him three times in my life. Well, we corresponded when we were preparing for the trip. We didn't really hang out in the country. He was working on his roller. I didn't come there for a vacation either. Adriana sighed disappointedly. For a while she tried to pester her friend with questions, but soon she realized that she really didn't know anything. Thanking her for the coffee, the artist Cooper gasped. Kathy poured herself a second cup some time and drink, pensively looking at the worn wallpaper on the wall, then resolutely picked up her phone. Adriana came to see me, trying to ask me the reasons for your breakup this. It seems you've riddled your entourage with intrigue, wrote the girl in messengers. A minute later, the phone rang. Charles' number popped up on the display. Hi. They got to you too. He said into the phone. Well, I'm kind of related. Vanessa grinned and said something to our artist. What could I say? I said I don't know anything. This is strictly your business. I had nothing to do with it. So you had nothing to do with it? Charles asked, a little surprised for some reason. Of course I'm indirectly to blame for your finding out about her affairs, but I'm not going to tell your company about them. Am I? So you'll have to come up with some plausible explanation for your decision to appease the public. She finished mockingly. I already have, and I'll tell everyone that I broke up with Betty because of you. How's that sound? Will you be my girlfriend? Kathy was silent for a few seconds, then said slowly, If it's a joke, it's a bad one. And if it isn't, I'm not ready to discuss it right now. I have to get ready for school. I just wrote to warn you. Bye. Bye. She hung up. It rang. She sat for a while longer, looking at the familiar pattern on the wallpaper and sighed, heading for the Andes. Anyway, the lectures would start in 2 o'clock and there was no need to be late for them. Charles looked thoughtfully at the phone screen, carefully lay the gadget on the table. She wasn't ready to discuss it, but she should be. Yes, any girl in her position would have agreed without hesitation to a guy like him. Gustman, even for most city girls, he's a bargain. What about a college girl from the country? With money, with an apartment, good-looking, with a light character, not bad in bed. 
Not bad at all. He remembered the night he spent in tears. He bet his head that the girl was pleased with him, more than pleased. And what more did she want? Charles tried diligently to get angry, but he couldn't. In the past few days he had realized that he needed this student from the village, and she was the only one. The night didn't faze the guy. He hadn't experienced anything like it in a long time, or maybe never at all. Betty, like the partners Charles had had before her, had diligently flaunted their sexuality, cultivated it, nurtured and cherished it. And in bed they were inventive and temperamental. But Gustman felt every time he made love to Betty, it was as if he were working for the camera. She had to be more than just loved. She had to be impressed. Everything was always very beautiful, very long, very calibrated and cinematic. Allah took graceful poses, made sure her face was turned to her partner in an exceptionally favorable angle. She moved too smoothly and even moaned melodiously. Sometimes Charles mockingly wondered if she wrote her own scripts every time she stayed overnight at his place. It was too much like a competently made erotic movie. Sure, the process excited and thrilled the guy, but after it was over Gustman was always left with some feeling of emptiness and artificiality, and the tears were completely different. The girl, who in everyday communication seemed just nice and did not cause any red thoughts in bed, turned out to be very sexy, passionate, relaxed, and sincere. Charles somehow immediately realized that she did not care about any impressions. Kathy wanted him exactly him, not some invented hero from a long red lady's novel or just her fantasies. And she took everything he could offer her, not thinking about the angles of smooth movements, the melodic style of his quiet cries. And she gave everything she could, too, completely unashamed of her body and her reactions, not caring what Charles might think of her. It's that genuine desire. That genuine passion is the real thing. Hurt the guys far more, far deeper than he'd first thought. That night he did not analyze anything, just gave in to emotions, sensations, plunged into them with his head and forgot about everything. And only sometimes he would suddenly surface and as if looking at himself from the outside, he was surprised to note, wow, it happens like that. He could not believe that a simple touch to a woman's body, far from the model standards, can so surround and head damage such strong emotions. But he immediately threw away his surprise and disbelief, and again plunged into the sweet whirlpool of caresses and kisses. Funny, but the only time when Charles, as it turned out, had sex on camera, he was extremely relaxed and sincere and did not think about the script for a second. Damer. Yes, since morning he had discovered that she was still writing the happening in front of her. And the first thing he wanted to do was delete the recording. But then I was curious. What was going on that night that he feels so happy and embarrassed like a schoolboy after his first kiss with the girl of his dreams? Maybe it was worth revisiting and finding out and he left the clip and later revisited it more than once and even subjected it to some editing, cutting out everything that didn't involve sex. But he could not find the answer to his question. After studying for a week, Charles decided that he should just repeat the experiment, and maybe not once or twice, but as many times as it took to get to the truth, to understand why it took him so long to get rid of his thoughts about it. An unremarkable, generally unremarkable girl. What's she so fascinated by? It's Kathy. That time in the village, waking up in the morning and looking at the glowing light bulb under the ceiling that neither of the two of them had ever realized to turn off. Throughout the night, Gustman worried about how Kathy would behave. Suddenly, the girl would start hitting on him, or with glances and hints, reminding him of what had happened. Or maybe she'd start blackmailing him. It happens. However, Kathy behaved in a completely normal way, as if nothing had happened between them. She was still sweet and friendly, as a hospitable hostess should be, but nothing more. The boy did not notice any meaningful glances, not a drop of embarrassment, not a hint of the previous night at breakfast, as if she had gone to bed with him solely to fulfill the duty of hospitality. Then Charles was again distracted by Dimka and his friends, 
who came to the house right from the morning, and then he spun with the shooting or defense did not see. Only just before leaving suddenly realized that on the one hand, he was afraid to get into the same car with her, afraid of explanations on the road. And on the other hand, he wanted these explanations to understand what she thought about everything that had happened. At the same time, Betty Gustman is practically forgotten about. Wrote her a text message in the morning, put his phone on silent mode, and put his ex-fiancee out of his mind. But he was worried about Kathy. To his relief and surprise, the girl behaved completely calm. All the way to the city she read, occasionally pausing to mull over information and inspect a book. Bringing her to the driveway, Charles unloaded a volume of clean parental bags from the trunk. Taking advantage of the fact that there was a car with an occasion, loaded the daughters, a month's supply, hits, hauled the bulks up to the floor, taking over the apartment. Kathy gently thanked the guy for his help and judging by her mood, intended to say goodbye. And then Charles could not stand it. Listen, he said to his front door, I wanted to talk about tonight. Is there anything to talk about? Vanessa was surprised. The prepared speech stuck in Charles' throat. You were upset to hear about Valka. You wanted to calm down somehow, to redirect your energy, to distract yourself, maybe get back at her. That's the only reason this happened, and I had nothing to do with it. You would have gone to bed with any other girl. I just happened to fall into your lap. Just the usual erotic impromptu from a guy who has been hurt. No, it was definitely good. I'm well aware it won't happen again, so there's nothing to discuss. I'm glad you and I have the same perception of this situation. Crushed, Charles nodded goodbye and left the apartment. It was only a few days later, when the first impressions had subsided, when the accidental video had been rewatched more than once, and when he was finally able to admit to himself that he wanted to do it again. Custman suddenly thought, well, I in my then state would have laid with any girl and Lenachka just happened to fall into my lap. But why did you agree to stay with me tonight? Had he known that Kathy had been tormented with the same question all these days and was terribly afraid to formulate a truthful answer to it, at least for herself, Betty had not been able to find a place for the second week. Her ex-fiance's behavior had offended her to the core. She was indignant, angry and unhappy at the same time. First of all, because she'd been dumped in the first place. Such a thing had never happened to the beautiful Betty. She was always the first to break up a relationship. Secondly, it pissed me off that Garrick informed me about the breakup via messenger and just put it in front of me, refusing to give any explanations. It was disgusting and humiliating, but also not subsiding attention of friends added Wendy to the fire, igniting the girl from the inside out. At first their looks were sympathetic, but quickly changed to interested curiosity, and a little later became something contemptuously pitying. Her first beauty of the company was thrown by a guy whom no one took seriously, even for video blogs, who played sharply to herself in children's toys. Already a few years declared in the status of a beginner YouTube, she was not good. How do you live with a reputation like that? How does it feel to bear such a blow to one's self-esteem? At first, Betty was infuriated, suffering aimlessly, but soon her emotions transformed into a burning hatred that quickly found Robert. Naturally, it was directed at Charles. Guys, revenge was needed for her Al-Qaeda-tainted reputation, for the ruined plans for a future in which she saw herself as Mrs. Gustman, secure and carefree for the few years she had spent having an affair with him, though she could have used them more productively. The idea of revenge came quickly. To Charles, what was most dear to him was his channel. And, as the girl had noticed, its popularity had begun to grow steadily recently after two commercials about a young cyber athlete and an old lady gamer show. So the channels need to be destroyed. I just have to figure out how. Betty was lucky. When she was sorting through the box of things Charles had brought her, she found a set of keys to his apartment. It was in the cosmetics room among the creams, pencils, liners, and other things every beauty needs. The guy just didn't see it. He probably didn't even look in the cosmetics. Why would he? Good, 
Betty decided. Now she had access to his house, which meant she had access to his computer. So she could get on there and delete his stupid channel and his account with all the videos and subscribers. That's the kind of thing that would give Charlesk a stroke. It would be the cruelest revenge, even tougher than marrying an oligarch and making him hire Gustman to clean the toilet. The only thing left to do was to get the moment when Charles would leave the house for at least a couple of hours and break into the apartment, and then she could figure out what to do. Betty had to spy on Charles' house for several days. Eventually, luck smiled on her. The guy walked out of the driveway and headed for the nearest parking lot. The king of the ring picked out a car, got in it, and drove off somewhere. Betty wasn't too interested in where. She realized that Charles was going to the other side of town. He didn't like to order a cab that far, so she had at least 200 hours. Having waited for order about 15 or 20 minutes to be sure that Gustman did not forget anything and would not come back soon. The girl quickly entered the entryway and then, trying not to make any noise, slipped into the apartment. The first thing she did was to look and trace her possible rival in the rooms of the kitchen bathroom. Suddenly, Charlesk had another woman, and it was because of her that he had flipped out. Then she's worth tracking down and smashing into the wall too. Betty will figure out how, but she found no unaccounted for feminine belongings of the abandoned bride. So she went to her always-on computer, sat down in her chair, and studied her desktop. Looking for a browser icon, she wasn't a very confident user, but her iPhone was sufficient for her daily needs. And then, like Charles, working with a desktop computer. The girl never kept track, so she had to look closely at all the shortcuts and folders. Files piled up on the desktop. The name of one of the files. The video caught the girl's attention. Charles always named the recordings in a pattern first with the date of shooting and then the title of the story. Apparently, this role had been taken on the exact day that he had received the breakup message from Gusman. The title, however, was not here at all. Hence the intrigue and spile. Clicked and mouse over Apple to start playback. And froze. Came on the line unable not to tear her eyes away from the screen not to believe what she sees. Foxy little Foxy. All right, knave girl. That's her correctness. That's her morality, her naivety. She jumped into bed with her sister's fiancé. No shame, no conscience. She's a juvenile bitch. And the groom's a good one. What did he find in this countryside? Why did he fall for her? He didn't just fall for her for real. Judging by the fact that he dumped her Betty, if he'd just slept with the cute, silly one under his arm, it wouldn't have been a big deal. Girls of this status, maids, waitresses, saleswomen, student nurses did not perceive as rivals, and sex with them put them on the same level as onanism. A man wanted to blow off steam. What's the difference? Will he work for it with his hand or use such a disposable girl? It doesn't make any difference. Betty wouldn't consider it cheating, but she wouldn't have noticed the episode. But with the breakup, this episode took on a whole different coloring. Watching to the end as Charles had fun with her sister. The girl wouldn't. She irritatedly turned on the video and went to the balcony for a smoke and come to her senses. She was literally shaking with anger. But fortunately, the cigar port revealed not only cigarettes, but also a joint recently given by a buddy. After a few puffs, Betty let go. And a minute later, a new plan came into her head, with the help of which she would be able to destroy both her former fiancé, her Rasputina, and her relative at one stroke. The idea was brilliant, but required returning to the computer and complete concentration. Well, I did my best. Just an hour of fiddling with her submissive equipment and home porn. Charles and Kathy's footage was uploaded to the Savin Gamers channel. Subscribers will rejoice contentedly, Betty thought. Slipping out of her ex fiancés apartment, Charles returned home after dark. He'd been mindlessly driving around the city for the past few hours, not paying attention to which way he was going or where he was turning. His cell phone was dead, but he didn't plug it into the car protector. He knew that it was only necessary to turn on the gadget. Someone would write or call. 
Some silly notification would come, notifications about events from YouTube, and he didn't want to hear, see, or read anything. He just wanted to disappear. Charles met Kathy outside the university in the middle of the day. At the moment of the end of classes, he invited her to some restaurant nearby, ordered a light dinner, and at the end with his seriousness and responsibility, and for some reason with a terrible excitement offered her to become his girlfriend, and received a polite, logical, reasonable refusal, expressed in the same friendly manner, which made it all the more frustratingly devastating and murderous. I believe your offer is nothing more than a momentary whimper. Vanessa said calmly, looking into the boy's face. You've been through a breakup, a betrayal, found a moment's comfort in me, and now you just want to prolong it. Even if it doesn't seem that way to you right now, believe me, you'll quickly realize what's really driving you, and you'll start to grow weary of our relationship. You and I are not a couple. Charles recognizes that we have different financial situations, different experiences, different social statuses. You're used to a different kind of girl, and you'll get bored of me quickly. Although, of course, for a while you will like the novelty of sensations, but then you will start to shy away from me. And that's unpleasant and humiliating. Let's just be good buddies, friends. As such, we're nothing to each other. You're definitely a nurse, not a psychologist. Charles grinned, listening to this rebuke. No, what kind of psychologist are you? Then you'd realize that you're rejecting me for one simple reason. You're just afraid. You're so afraid of liking me that you've decided in advance that our relationship is doomed to fail. You're afraid to even try. What makes you think I like you, defensive? Kathy asked. Because you were with me, you didn't push me away. You didn't make a scene when I started hitting on you. And because I remember how you were with me. I know how girls who jumped in just for sex behave in bed. They could never be like you. Passionate, tender, loving, sincere, and real. Do you believe yourself right now? When you tell me you don't want a relationship. But I'm sorry, you didn't lie that night. The girl's cheeks flared. She lowered her eyes and scrutinized the tablecloth for a few seconds. Then she looked up at Charles and said firmly, That's my business now what it was when I was, and now I have studies, work to help my parents, and there's just no time for a relationship, even with you YouTube star. So sorry, it's out of the question. Goodbye. Kathy got up from the table and hurriedly left the restaurant. I even mentioned her stupidly. I was just trying to take one last stab at her. You're my girl, Charles thought with a kind of detached tenderness. And only then did she fully realize that it was really for last. Kathy gave him a turn once and for all. Charles Gustman didn't remember the rest of the evening. At first he was driving around town, trying to figure out how to proceed, how to assuage Kathy's fear of the difference in their social and financial status and convince her to be together. But the longer he remembered the girl's behavior, the deeper into her character, the more unpromising began to seem to the guy any ideas that arose in his head. In the end, out of the torment of thoughts, Charles sank into a kind of dull indifference. He didn't remember leaving the car in the parking lot and returning to the apartment. He didn't turn on the light or even undress. He just collapsed on the bed and fell asleep without his family. In the morning, he was awakened by the insistent ringing of the doorbell. On the threshold stood Uncle John, the father. The boy barely had time to utter a surprised expression. Hello, as he received the strongest blow in the face, knocking him to the ground. Hush, hush. An unfamiliar male voice sounded above Charles' head. Of course, I understand everything, but let's not do self-mutilation. The stairwell and hallway were suddenly filled with footsteps and voices. Two uniformed policemen appeared next to Uncle John and someone else in plain clothes, unfamiliar. Charles was lifted from the floor, briefly asked how he was feeling, and taken to a room to talk and look at a computer. Everything that happened next, the guy understood with difficulty their tears. The video turned out to be published on the network, on his channel from his computer. How could this have happened? He had no idea and couldn't explain. 
The guide dutifully recounted his last night as best he could, explained that no outsiders had access to his channel or computer. He tried to remember in what service he had booked a car, where he had ridden it, explained how and under what circumstances the ill-fated videotape had appeared, and then listened for a long time to the name of the articles under which he is accused by Kathy's father. In his statement, the list turned out to be impressive. Manufacturing pornographic content, distribution of pornography, invasion of privacy, violation of privacy, humiliation of honor and dignity. It was like these phrases were seared into his brain. The guys were tearing him apart from the inside out. Somehow, and in one evening, he went from being an ordinary video blogger to a criminal and accused under investigation with no effort at all. Maybe he has partial amnesia. Maybe some particularly cunning virus had gotten into his computers and he didn't know what to think. But he realized quite clearly, Kathy wouldn't go anywhere near him now. There would be no relationship at all. Events were developing terrifyingly fast and not at all in favor of Charles. About why this happened, the guy found out much later. And then he paid the bill and left the restaurant. About 10 minutes after Kathy left, he got into his car and drove wherever he wanted to go. At this point, the ill-fated video finally uploaded the network and became available to subscribers of the channel. After a couple more minutes, Charles' phone turned off and disappeared from the network. The guy did not charge it and then did not find out that the gadget was not just discharged. Something had gone wrong with its settings and the operating system went down without the possibility of recovery. Subsequently, to find out whether it was an accidental failure or the owner damaged the phone deliberately to hide the possibility of remote control from his home computer was not possible. But in general, Charles had the remote connection set up. He periodically tapped the compass of a tablet or laptop, so he could from his phone. His prosecutors reasoned. William's election flashed an alert for a new video on the gamer's channel. The boy immediately rushed online to watch the novelty. It so happened that his parents were nearby. So the video was watched by the whole family. No sooner had they come to their senses than the woman of the field burst into the house screaming, Jenna, there's Kathy. There's a shame, for God's sake. I saw the faces of the neighbors, confused whispered. Sarah, what a Jesus. After Charles' visit to the village, all the local boys subscribed to his channel. It was a sure bet that half of them had already watched the scandalous video, which meant that all the adults in the village would know about it in a couple of hours, and by the evening they would see it in detail. How can we look people in the eye now? Aunt Jenna poured herself some corvole. Yes, I'll go now. I'll beat that gentleman's face in. Uncle John said cheerfully. But Wendy stopped the neighbor by throwing. It was all right. Rich John, he's a bastard a blogger, and he's got money, as I remember. You punch them in the face, he'll report you to the police, and he'll weaken the whole world. It's not like that. It's like suing him. Wait, like my grandson was Kevin the other day. Wait, he hasn't gotten far yet. Kevin's grandson was a successful lawyer, and as luck would have it, was running the office of one of Gustman Sr.'s main competitors. When I got a call from my grandmother, I found out what was going on. Kevin, Kevin, dead set on his chance to please a tough client. He explained in detail to Kathy's parents the charges that could be brought against the foul-mouthed blogger. The only point, he said, you need to clarify whether your daughter knew about the filming, consented to it, and to the publication of the footage. That's important. Really? Outraged was Aunt Jenna. Who do you take our Lizjinka for? But the lawyer was adamant. Kathy, who had just reached home, was called. It took the girl a long time to realize what was wrong. But when she did, she burst into tears. However, she quickly pulled herself together, gave the necessary explanations, and at the same time told about today's conversation with Charles. The bastard wanted revenge, she said reproachfully. He seemed so decent. What kind of guys are these days? A girl turned you down. So you should get drunk with grief. No, you have to shame the whole world. Kevin quickly made a few calls, 
including to his employer. Realizing what benefit can be derived from the scandal around the son of a competitor, to what scandal quickly put in the gun all those who need to again, and went with his grandson Wendy in the city, wrote an application. He was immediately taken to work, a case was opened, and then everything went very quickly, almost lightning fast. John himself, having sorted out the papers and statements, rushed to Kathy's house and arrived just in time. The daughter was on the verge of hysterics. It seemed that Betty had already called her and made a huge scandal. The girl accused her sister of betrayal, of stealing her fiancé from her, of driving her into depression, of ruining her future, and at the end she declared that she was going to immediately exile everyone who was friends with her on social networks. Let her find out what a homegrown porn star you really are. Sis reprinted it. Kathy rushed. It was too late to close her profiles in Vicontact and a couple of other popular platforms from the eyes of strangers. And Sophia sent out an unfortunate link to everyone before the conversation began, and the girl was flooded with messages from acquaintances, relatives, fellow students, and then from strangers who became her by the photo in the network. The amount of dirt that poured on Kathy from the screen led her to a state close to shock. Her father, who came to her, clung to her like a lifeline. She sobbed, showing him the incoming messages. Her hands were shaking with disgust and hopelessness. The girl didn't know how to cope with the shame that had fallen upon her. But worse, she couldn't figure out how to live with the feeling of betrayal. Charles, could he really have taken them off then? And he hadn't even asked for permission. No warning, no hint. The same Charles she had fallen in love with at first sight at a random party and lived with that love. Lived with that love. All the last few months she tried to get along, to cope with that feeling, and finally she'd realized she couldn't overcome it. Just as she would not be able to transcend her lover's relationship with her sister, even though her sister, not a close relation to the rotten, absorbent cotton, but would be able to take root in his company, fit into his lifestyle, reach his level. Over the past summer and fall, Kathy had deployed a great deal of inner work, trying to make sure that her sudden feeling did not harm her, her lover, or their family. Just once she had made a misstep, given a slip, it was that oversight that had now come back to haunt her. Could she have been so wrong about this guy? How he who had seemed so sincere, so close, so real on that one night, had managed to turn around, a complete scoundrel, and use her to make an erotic video, to publish that video as revenge for refusing to date. What if? And he only offered to date so he could make more videos of her and start an erotic channel as well. The slingshots are not doing well. From these thoughts, the girl had a nervous breakdown, which smoothly turned into a prolonged depression. Parents tried to treat her at home, invite doctors, but after a few months, Kathy had to be hospitalized in a local psychiatric hospital. Outpatient treatment did not help. She spent six months in the hospital, and then about a year more recovered from the disease. True, for this she had to be sent to her relatives in a neighboring region. It was impossible to return to the village after everything that had happened. It would have nullified all the results of the treatment. She had to say goodbye to her studies. Kathy could not imagine how she would return to the university and look into the eyes of teachers and fellow students. The girl constantly dreamed that she was dishonored, knew everything. Everyone was pointing fingers at her, laughing behind her back. There were no more medical universities nearby, and Kathy's health did not allow her to go somewhere far away alone. The girl stayed with relatives and became a nurse at the local hospital, where she worked for the rest of her life. While Kathy was in the hospital, Charles was tried. The guy was sent to prison for six years and that thanks to the diligent efforts of his father. But Gustman Sr. couldn't commute the sentence or keep the case quiet. The lawyers were too zealous. Competitors by sheer coincidence, family business, as a result of scandals and litigation, of course, not collapsed, but shaken. All that happened affected the reputation of the father Charles not for the better. Income fell and give his son money to compensate the injured party Kathy and her family for moral damage. The elder Gustman refused. 
Charles' apartment went under the hammer to pay off the debt and legal fees, but the boys cared little. Until the very last moment, he tried to ask Uncle Petia Aunt Jenna, his parents and buddies to help him contact Kathy, explain himself to her, convince her that he was up to no harm, and that he had nothing to do with leaking the video. But he was never given that opportunity. He wrote long detailed letters to the girl, but no one wanted to pass them on, not to disturb the Lesjinka. Out of contempt for the hapless porn blogger himself, as his friends began to refer to him with derision. In his first month in the colony, Charles hanged himself in one of the staff quarters. His parents buried him in the same town where the penitentiary was located, and they made sure that no one in their hometown knew what had happened. Betty went to conquer the capital and two years later married a successful Moscow businessman. The fact that her husband is 25 years older than her, the girl is not embarrassed at all. His income suits me, usually, she says, and as for the age, it has its advantages. This nice old man pays my bills and does not interfere with my life. And he certainly won't ditch me for some net like a younger suitor. She adds to herself and mentally thanks Charles for teaching her a lesson. And the worst part is that she does it sincerely. Subscribe and click the bell. There was a sense of celebration in the house. It was because Emily was about to become a mother. But at the moment she was in the maternity ward, and Camille was looking after all this beauty. Camille would show up around the house and click her tongue. She had never imagined that her son-in-law would be so calculating an offer to renovate the nursery himself. And no one had pulled his tongue. It was a personal initiative. At the same time, before that he had not even thought of starting the repair. And naturally, the mother-in-law had vague suspicions. She was somehow wary of the generosity of her son-in-law. He avoided extra money, considering it a waste. But in this case, he made an exception, and even it seems, went wild. To the fullest, using the services of professional designers. Her daughter wanted a modest interior, but Michael insisted on his version, and it was accepted as it came to his liking, and even pleased the eye with beautiful decoration. Camille sat down and sighed with relief and said to herself, now you can live for yourself. The daughter is in good hands. Consider that life is successful. And just at that time, she received a call. And the third one today, I shook my head. She pressed the call button and answered. Yes, my dear, and I'm listening. Michael's mom hasn't arrived yet. Sounded her question with anxiety in her voice. Not yet, but I think it will be soon. What's wrong? Are you scared of something? I think I'm going into labor today. I'm having contractions. Daughter, calm down. I'll soon Camille got up from the table and started packing. Don't. Mom, no one will let you come to me anyway, protested Emily. I'll wait on the bench in the yard. No one will kick me out of there. How can you miss such a moment? It's better to stay at home. If Michael comes back from his business trip, you'll come with him. While I'm waiting for my son-in-law, my grandson will be born without me. That's the thing you care. And Michael just left. Emily cried. He knew I was going to have a baby soon. He didn't stay. His job's so expensive. He can't help it if Camille calms his daughter down. It's mom. I can't talk anymore. The contractions started again. And I realized, my good girl, have an easy labor. She shouted the last words just as Emily actually turned off the phone. Whether her daughter heard them or not, Camille began to pack and put the most necessary things in her bag. Looking at her watch and figuring the last time she called her son-in-law, she dialed his number again. But he answered me. And there was anxiety on my soul, and with it the alarm bell rang. True, there was no time to compare facts and draw any conclusions. Her daughter was probably already taken to the delivery room, and she could not afford to leave her without support. At the same time, a successful delivery took time, and it was not worth waiting until the evening for the baby to appear. And to Camille decided to go because her heart was not in the right place. She was so much worried about her daughter that she could lie next to her in the delivery room. She had all kinds of thoughts going through her head. What if the labor dragged on, would she be able to bear it? Emily was about to become a mother for the first time. 
and naturally, she felt emotional stress. But a mother in this situation would not be able to help her. Well, except morally, in principal relatives and friends were allowed to be present at the birth and could stand beside her. Emily would have felt even more attention and care, but they had not discussed this moment beforehand. And now she did not make such a responsible decision on the fly. Calling a cab an hour later, Camille went down to the entrance. We had to wait only five minutes before a black foreign car arrived. Behind the wheel sat a man of 35 years old and with a beard. In the back seat, she said hello to him and pronounced, If it's all right with you, can you give me a little more gas? I urgently need to go to the maternity hospital, and I will pay more than the standard rate. Are you going to express? The driver asked in surprise. Although it was obvious that he wanted to support the conversation in a joking way. Yes, right here, without leaving the cash register. It's past my time, I'm going to my daughter, she's in labor. And don't ask any more stupid questions. Or I'll tell you so much, you won't be happy. I'm sorry, I made a bad joke. I'll see you tonight. Don't be nervous. Another thing is a joker. But on the whole it's not a bad idea, and I'll think about it at my leisure. I have a daughter, but never had a son. That's what I mean. The driver nodded, I'm putting on more gas. And you say time has passed. Women have babies even later in life, so it's not surprising. Thanks for the kind word. I'll keep it in mind. She thanked him for such a generous compliment. In fact, he and her person elevated all women to heaven and made her realize that age is not a hindrance. For the continuation of the species would be the desire to become a mother, and nature itself will try. And if everything is normal, a healthy and beautiful child will definitely be born. In addition, statistics show that it was much easier and simpler for mature women to give birth. By that time they knew exactly what to expect from further life, and were not afraid to bring up a child, at least of that very fear. During the first labor was no longer there. In the maternity hospital, such women felt calm and did not worry about trifles, humbly waiting for the baby to appear. Camille only thought about it for a moment and immediately herself twitched. Her own pregnancy was not part of her plans, especially three years ago she had buried her husband. And for the time being, she was not going to tie herself with new grim ties in the near future. Among those men who came her way, she did not see a worthy candidate. Most of them were leftist and perpetually dissatisfied with their lives. They had constant doubts about their own prospects. And Camille realized that from such a contingent we will not make a good one. That's why she decided to live for herself and her beloved daughter. Meanwhile, the cab driver increased the gas. And soon there was a building of a maternity hospital. The roof and windows glowed in the bright sunlight, as if huge spotlights had been directed at them on purpose. Camille squinted, trying to see his daughter in one of them. But all of them, as it turned out, were obscured by half-transparent curtains. Slowed down at the entrance, the driver turned to her and said cheerfully, as promised, with a breeze. Thank you. I noticed that. She answered him excitedly and gave him the fare. Can you keep the change? The service is not bad. The jokes are not very good. But on the whole, it's fine. That's what I understand clear and to the point your daughter's successful labor and all the best. Nodding goodbye, Camille got out of the car and hurried to the central entrance. There she was stopped by a guard and asked to wait for the nurse on duty. Five whole minutes passed before she appeared. Good afternoon. I've got a daughter on bed rest here. Can I see her at least a glimpse? Good afternoon. What's her first and last name? Emily is 25 years old. Brown hair. Okay, stop. You don't need to list her physical appearance. The nurse interrupted her and looked at the list. I already know who we're talking about. She's in the labor and delivery ward, but you'll still have to wait. The midwives are doing their best, but it's not fast. You know that. Of course it is. Camille exclaimed. It's not like you're in a performance arena. We have other women in labor who need to rest. Really, you can understand the excitement and all that. I'm sorry, I'm really, really nervous. And you said the midwives are trying. Emily's having some kind of problem. No, it's just that the baby seems to be big. The nurse replied with a smile, and then she adjusted her robe. Well, this is the news, we will have a rich man in our family. What happiness! 
I cannot even convey in words. Save your emotions for future congratulations. When your daughter gives birth, then you'll jump with happiness. In the meantime, you have to wait for her first labor. It may not be her last. Thank you, Evelyn. Evelyn is the nurse's name. Yes, thank you, Evelyn. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Camille nodded. You're welcome. But the midwives are to be commended. They're the ones who bring babies into the world. It's their most demanding job. It takes a lot of effort and nerve for moms to give birth safely. That's true. I forgot all about it on the way here. Well, you'll be expecting, won't you? I have work to do. As soon as this miraculous event happens, I'll let you know. Then I'll sit on the bench in the courtyard. There's some shade. The nurse looked at the guard. He nodded and said, you can wait here. It's not outdoors and sitting in the heat for so many hours is not the best solution. Thank you. Good health and prosperity to you. Camille thanked them. And while her daughter was in labor, she sat next to the guard. He entertained her as best he could with funny anecdotes. But they were only soothing for a moment, and then the troubling thoughts would return. And Camille frowned her eyebrows at the thought of her daughter in the maternity ward. At the same time, she relied on the professionalism of the midwives, because the nurse's words about their work gave her cautious optimism. Glancing at her watch, every now and then she turned her head toward the corridor. It was from there that the nurse would appear and deliver the long-awaited news. But as time passed, Evelyn did not return, and Camille became visibly nervous. Her hands shook and her left eye twitched. The guard noticed her nervousness and tried to calm her down. Everything will be fine. You'll see, our midwives are the best around. It's been a long time since Evelyn's been here. They told you it was a difficult labor. The baby's big, the guard reminded the nurse. Daughter, my darling, may you do well. Camille said with tears in her eyes. Waiting was weighing on her nervous system, and she could hardly sit in one place. From time to time, she got up from her chair to walk a little and stretch her legs. The guard shook his head, but did not interfere with her with his advice. He realized that words could not solve everything, especially the worries of his own mother. So he calmly observed the situation, looking at the crossword puzzle. Meanwhile, Camille went outside again. She needed a breath of fresh air in her temples. Pulse was vomiting and the back of her head was broken. So she could barely contain the piercing pain and coupled with the worry it was pressing even harder on her brain. Finally, towards evening, when already patience was at the limit, heard the voice of the nurse, she flew straight down the corridor, and gesticulating joyfully at that. From her look and the smile on her face Camille realized that the labor had ended successfully. A boy at 3,952 centimeters. A giant. Congratulations. You can see your daughter. It's such a blessing. What kind of happiness? I'm the happiest grandmother in the world now. By the way, am I allowed in her room? Through the glass, look. But if the doctor says it's okay, you can hold the baby. We can allow husbands and close relatives in the labor room. Is it your daughter's husband here? No, he's on a business trip, shook his head Camille. He was sent away unexpectedly just before the birth. Well, he will be even happier when he arrives. The nurse smiled. Yes, you're probably right. Camille said, almost in a whisper. She couldn't hear a thing. Let's go, and I'll show you to your daughter. But before they went upstairs, they went into a room and Camille changed her clothes. She was given a white robe, a bonnet, and booties. And so she went to her daughter's room. And while she silently followed the nurse, she wrote a message to her son-in-law. Congratulations on your son. Four kilograms bogator. But no reply to the message came at the same second. And that made her a little wary. She naively thought that Michael was just waiting to be excited about the birth of a child. But in fact, he was completely in work and was practically not distracted by anything. He didn't even read the message from his mother-in-law right away. Going up to the second floor, they walked down a long corridor and stopped near room number seven. Through the glass, you could see her daughter lying on a special bed. And most importantly, with her next to her was a child, whom she gently pressed to her chest crying. Camille looked at the nurse. I'm looking at you and I can't help but let you come into the room. Besides, the doctor said yes, but not for long. 
and I understand and thank you for your kindness. Having opened the door, she cautiously peeped in and immediately met her eyes with Emily's daughter and cried with joy, holding the child with one hand and beckoned them to her with the other. Mother, how happy I am to have such a son. I only wish Michael could see it. Camille went to the bed and leaned over and kissed her on the top of her head. At that moment, the baby frowned and began to fuss. Without thinking, she took him in her arms and began to rock him, humming a lullaby. After a couple minutes, he calmed down and there was silence again. Emily rose up on one elbow and cocked an eyebrow. Disgruntled, she asked. He still hadn't made contact. Not yet, no, I sent him a message. Should respond. I called too, but Michael didn't even pick up. Is he so busy he can't even pick up the phone? Don't worry about it. He'll answer or call back, Camille tried to reassure her daughter. And just as she said these words, a familiar music started playing. It was a message notification coming in. Handing the baby back to Emily, she pulled out her phone and began to read. It didn't take her more than a minute to familiarize herself with the contents of the message from her son-in-law. And judging by her facial expressions, she wasn't too happy about it. But something mom sent Michael. Yeah, you guessed it. I just didn't see much joy. Give it to me. I'll read it myself. Emily demanded her phone and she handed it over. For about a minute too, she drove her eyes around, studying her husband's reply. It contained the following words. Thank you. Wow, I don't have any heroes in my family. It must be some kind of phenomenon. Tell Emily I'll be there soon. That was the end of the message. What did he mean by phenomenon? She never understood it, but it sounded kind of hurtful. Like Michael didn't believe it was his son. Emily handed the phone back to her mother and cried. Daughter, what are you doing? He just texted that he wasn't expecting such a big guy. I'd be surprised too, if I were him. To be honest, we don't have any similar cases in our family. And neither have you. Mom almost screamed at Emily. You think it's some kind of phenomenon too. And the baby's not Michael's. No, I don't think so. I shook my head. It's okay. You can't be nervous right now. Then why did he text me like that? Why didn't he congratulate me anyway? Why didn't he call me? Just be patient for a while. When he has a free moment, he'll do it and she was right on the money again. Because Emily's phone was interrupted, she purposely turned the sound down so that it wouldn't make noise or scare the baby. Her husband's name popped up on the screen and she immediately smiled. Hello, my love. His gentle voice sounded into the receiver. I'm sorry I couldn't attend the birth in person, but you know how I react to such events. Yes, of course, we have already discussed it calmly and without nerves, replied Emily. I want to congratulate you, or rather us on the birth of our son, and wish him good health, and you and I have enough endurance and patience for the rest of our lives. Thank you. That was really nice to hear. But I'm still a little hurt that you left on the eve of the birth. You could have talked to the company and stayed. The director is aware of it, but he just had no other choice. Michael replied with regret in his voice. And I'll try to make up for what I missed. Love. Okay, I get it. Work is work. Emily sounded a little uncertain, and it sounded like veiled resentment. I'm sorry, I really didn't have a chance to come, but I'm traveling back tomorrow. So I'll see you soon. Ethan and I will be waiting for you very much. Did you decide on that name after all? Michael asked. Yes, those two, I canceled them, because they don't sound like your middle name. What do you think? Do you like it? You bet, Ethan's bright and presentable, but kisses, sweetheart. I have to go to a meeting. And I kiss you, my love, and wish you good luck. Emily pressed the hang-up button and placed the phone carelessly on the nightstand. What's wrong with you? Are you not happy that you talked to your husband? Her mother asked in surprise. Yes and no. He answered dryly, as if you were recording. It was as if he wasn't talking to me, but to his colleagues. Maybe you imagined it. No. I'm not deaf, and my heart can feel everything. At that moment, the baby stirred again, and she gently put her arm around him and kissed him gently on the nose. The joy of motherhood restrained Emily from harsh words to her husband, and it was telling that she was very nervous, perhaps because of the difficult labor, or was there some other reason? 
at the same time to answer clearly and distinctly to herself what she was worried in the first place. Emily could not yet. She thought for a moment, and it seemed to her mother that her daughter had fallen into a comatose state. At least, that's what it looked like from the outside. And to make sure that everything was all right, she came closer and cautiously said, Daughter, I still haven't gone anywhere here. I can see mommy just caught the silence, frowned Emily. Sometimes it's actually quite helpful. Just staring at one point and thinking about something. And what would that be, if it's not a secret? Like why I didn't ask him about that message. Well, you heard him say he was in a hurry to get to a meeting, your mother shrugged. Exactly, that's what's important, not my labor. He just pretended to be happy and didn't say anything about his doubts. As if I did not understand from whom I gave birth to a rich man. Don't say that, daughter. Or we will really start doubting together and it will not lead to anything good. We should be happy, not looking for reasons to fight. I wasn't going to fight with Michael, I shrugged. Emily was just saying her thoughts out loud. Let's keep them between us, Camille nodded. You were so happy when you heard your husband's voice. And now it's irritation talking, fatigue and nervous tension. My mother is probably right, and I'm probably making myself nervous. I just need to relax and not think about sad things. Especially since Michael said he'd be here soon. Exactly. Maybe he'll pick you up from the hospital too. Irritation and nervousness. Indeed, Emily still hadn't let go, and it made her even more cranky, like a little girl. But that's not surprising. After childbirth, women do not immediately come to their senses. They need time to calm down, and sometimes it drags on for several days. At this time, close people have to show outstanding patience, and none of them grumble. Everyone realizes that childbirth is not a procedure in a space salon, and the most real trials. There have been cases where women have almost lost their lives, and all because they differed in body condition and skeletal structure. Emily, however, was lucky in this respect. She was a girl in a body, and she had no trouble bringing a child into the world. Yes, she had to strain and scream, but it worked. Plus, the obstetricians showed a high quality of skill and ended up helping her deliver a healthy and large baby. Thank you for being by my side as always Emily thanked her mother. Well, how could I not? I was going through it myself, she smiled and nodded. And dad was working at the time too, wasn't he? Remember, he wasn't. But it was a different time then. He had a new position coming up, and he couldn't just take off. Not even his wife's people, Emily wondered. Even though she'd heard the story a hundred times, it couldn't be helped. The country needed professional staff, shrugged the mother. What about the children? They did too. But we didn't have as much support from the state then as you do now. We need to increase demography. That's what we're trying to do. Emily finally smiled, and it showed that her nervousness was gone. It was hoped that in the future she would be able to adapt to the postpartum period. In any case, she would not become cranky for any reason and show her irritation. In the maternity hospital, of course, a lot of things were forgiven and looked at certain things through their fingers. But if any mommy drove the staff to a white fury, they tried to say goodbye to her as quickly as possible and did everything to make her discharge sooner and leave the walls of the hospital. That's when there was silence. However, not for a long time, literally until the next cranky woman in labor. But they had time to rest and catch their breath. It was not so easy, it turned out, to take care of such patients and it was necessary to restrain themselves emotionally, so that patience did not break. Camille looked at her watch, sighed heavily, and asked cautiously, What can I get you tomorrow red apples and a couple of liters of grape juice? Maybe something to steam. If only a breast fillet, Emily shrugged. And don't forget the broth, I'll have that too. Okay, I'll do it. Her daughter smiled back, and took her grandson in her arms again, he calmed down and seemed to fall asleep, oblivious to external stimuli. Camille held him close to her and looked at him with a smile on her face. It was obvious that she was straight, partly as if she had given birth to a child of her own. Emily noticed the tears in her eyes, and she almost sobbed, too. I remembered how you used to read me a bedtime story when I was a child. 
You looked at me like that and smiled. And I still get chills running up and down my spine. Whenever I see that look, it's hereditary. My mom used to do the same thing, but she told stories not from books, but from memory. And to be honest, I wondered how she knew so much. Every day something new. And not a single repetition. That's a phenomenal memory. So you kept books in your hands as long as your eyesight allowed. I didn't really have a taste for them. And I don't now. Maybe Eppin won't go. And she made an indiscreet assumption. I don't know, Mama, Emily shrugged. He's only just born and he's not in the mood for books yet. But if you think it would be good for him, I can read stories to him sometimes. I think they say it calms the nervous system. Who knows, maybe he'll be less cranky. That would be nice, because I have a feeling he's taken over my personality. Just as hot-tempered and emotional. Tell me about it. Sometimes I wonder how Michael puts up with me. Emily rounded her eyes and shook her head. You see, you already do not scold him and do not get angry, said the mother. That's a sure sign that you're coming to your senses after childbirth. If you continue like this, they won't keep you here for long. How do you want me to get home as soon as possible? I can't wait to babysit my grandson. Yes, my daughter is a great joy to me. You're all grown up and you don't eat diapers. Your grandson, on the other hand, has his whole life ahead of him. And you need to make sure he's taken care of as much as possible. I know mom, especially since Michael's made all the arrangements. But at first, my son's still gonna be spending more time with us. I don't disagree. But you're gonna have to get him used to sleeping in his own crib. And if you don't do that, you'll never get him out of your skirt. So he's my little boy, and I love him very much. After Emily said that, she gestured for the baby to come back. Okay, go back to your mom, I still have time to babysit you. Kissed her grandson on the cheek, she gently laid him down next to her daughter. Emily smiled back and began to stroke her son in a feminine way. He flailed his brow and made funny lips. It was as if he had been having strange dreams, and they disturbed him a little. There was no cause for alarm, however, and so far she had nothing to worry about. She had been in such a confused state when she had not yet fully realized that she had given birth. She still imagined herself pregnant, and this child was there to support her. Meanwhile, her mother knew exactly what was happening to her daughter at that moment. Exactly 25 years ago, she too had been in the same state. But she came to her senses quickly. Maybe it was her mother's support, or maybe it was my own attitude. Daughter partially adopted the character of her husband, and he could sometimes flare up for no reason. And sometimes it was hard to stop him. No amount of persuasion helped. He then himself calmed down and wondered how such a thing could happen. Naturally, he apologized and vowed to keep himself in control. Soon, however, everything would happen again, and then the household simply did not pay attention to it. They did not take much pleasure in arguing with a man who persisted in his position. It was like beating against a wall that only gave off dust, but still held on. Camille's husband was distinguished by the fact that he rarely ever strayed from his principles. And if he did, everyone sighed in relief and jokingly said it would probably snow in the summer. I'm going to feed Ethan now and get some sleep, Emily said, getting back on her back. Okay, well, I'm going to go home and not come back to see you. Everything seems fine there. No, don't. Michael's coming back tomorrow, and I think he'll be here in a couple days and I'll probably be discharged by then. So he'll be back in time to pick me up from the hospital. Good, then yes, tomorrow will bring everything you asked for. Camille nodded and left the room. At that moment, the nurse Evelyn approached her. But as you can imagine, with my grandson with great pleasure, I wouldn't leave like this. Looking at him makes me want to cry. It always does. I don't have grandchildren yet, but I totally understand. Children are our future. And their future will depend on how we bring them up and what we put into them. Wise words, and I would even say golden. Camille praised her. And if it's not too difficult for you, then you should reconsider my daughter. She's a quiet girl, but she can get angry sometimes, so I'm worried about her having a nervous breakdown. Okay, I hear you. And she'll be monitored until she's discharged. Thank you in advance. You're a very kind and supportive person. But there are other reasons for her temper. Careful, asked the nurse. And at that frowned his eyebrows. 
Well, how can I tell you? For example, the peoples didn't come. Husband shrugged Camille, although they had discussed this point, but she still hoped that Michael would show up. Not every man can withstand such a spectacle. My spouse didn't attend the birth either. He said if you want me to fall right on top of you, you can take your chances. And I did not do it, because I presented the picture of falling two-meter man. And I became scared. But not for myself, but for the rest of the staff. Yeah, I hear you. But I still wanted to see him here today. I don't blame my son-in-law in any way. He's a really busy man and he works a lot. And sometimes he doesn't even have time for himself. Not to mention everything else. On the other hand, to make it less fussy, he tidied up the baby's room right away. You see, the nurse raised her index finger. He was worried and prepared in advance. Some people only start shopping after the baby is born and buy the most necessary things in a hurry, without considering the unnecessary expenses. What do you want to say with this? To the sea in the forehead? Camille asked. Well, you can buy cheaper if you know where to go. I mean that if everything is done at the last minute, it's a clear sign of disorganization. And then it affects everything on the relationship, on the child's upbringing and just on everyday life. I get it. I was thinking about the wrong thing. Thanks again for your support and goodbye. Have a good day. You don't have to worry about your daughter. She's in good hands. Camille took the same route back down to the first floor. The guard met her again and asked her with a smile on his face. So daughter and grandson. Everything went well, more than I am very satisfied. Just as cheerfully she replied. To him it feels like me again. Well, well, let's not talk about age. The guard interrupted her. We were all young once, as you so rightly point out, and most importantly, you spoke of youth. I still remember it, and I can't believe that time flew by so quickly. It takes a long time in the beginning, and then it slips away at full speed. Thank you for your kind words. After saying goodbye to the guard, she went outside and immediately dialed the number of a cab. By a strange coincidence, the same driver arrived five minutes later, he smiled broadly and said humorously, We are like two lonely hearts once met, and again we are magnetically attracted to each other. What a joke, you want to laugh and cry. Camille wagged his finger at him, and just like last time, she got in the back seat. I apologize if I've offended you. He apologized. The driver started the car and then asked quietly, Are we going to the same address? No, I'm going home now. I need to clean up and get a good night's sleep. So my daughter had a baby. Yeah, a boy, almost four pounds. Wow. Wow. He's gonna grow up to be a real big boy, and he's gonna take on all the boys in the yard. You're wrong. My daughter will raise him with nothing but good and positive qualities. I don't disagree. But it seems to me that almost all sons follow in the footsteps of their fathers. The driver shrugged his shoulders and at the same time made an assumption about the boy's future. We'll see. It's too early to make predictions now. Camille nodded affirmatively, and then she stopped talking. The driver realized that the conversation was over, and then they drove in complete silence. Even the music did not play in the speaker, although he always turned on a soothing melody and only for her he made an exception because after today's events, she needed complete peace. She hadn't told him that directly, of course, but the look on her face was enough to read her thoughts. All the way there, he kept glancing in the rearview mirror, worried the passenger wouldn't get sick. She talked to him sluggishly and generally looked tired, but that's understandable. All day she sat in the corridor, waiting for her daughter to give birth, did not gather herself and did not leave with honor, withstood this ordeal and it's a good thing the guard was so talkative, with his not-so-funny anecdotes. He distracted her a little from sad thoughts, and at the same time did not let her fall asleep. Otherwise, she'd lie right where she was sitting. All in all, it had been a busy day, especially for the nervous system. It was only towards the end when the nurse told her the good news. After that, it seemed, one could not only dance, but also start one's life with a clean slate. However, if Camille had been offered something like that, she would definitely have refused. And first of all, because there would be no Emily in her new life. And she wanted a daughter so much, and she resembled her in every way. And nature responded with a long-awaited gift. That's why she wouldn't have started from scratch. 
Besides, she wouldn't have all the events and moments she'd been through. Twenty minutes later, they pulled up to the right house. And the driver loudly announced the final stop. Yes, thank you in a sleepy voice. She answered him and took the money out of her purse. Apparently, she fell asleep and didn't realize she'd slept through the whole route. Keep the change as always. Thank you and have a good day. You too. I waved him off. Camille entered the entrance and went up to the third floor. Something clicked in the keyhole. And in a few seconds, she was in the hallway. No other sounds were even close to being heard. The silence and emptiness echoed from everywhere, as if she had fallen under the ground. Though in fact, that was exactly how she felt now. In the soul from side to side through despair and all, because there was no dedication in the form of concrete cases. There was no doubt that helping her daughter was going to count for something. However, she needed something more. And now with the birth of her grandson, there was a faint hope that she would no longer sit in these four walls like a bird in a cage. Camille had recently experienced the full extent of loneliness, and this despite the presence of her daughter, who loved her with all her heart. As it was easy to guess, the whole problem was up for grabs. Michael had a way of pushing people away from him, and yet doing absolutely nothing about it. In other words, a person did not immediately notice that he was alienated, but only after some time, when it was too late to change anything. And Camille was seriously afraid that she would lose the point. Or rather, the opportunity to see her would be taken away from her, and she would be put in front of an uncomfortable fact, forced to accept it as a new reality. Soon, however, the opposite happened, and a series of severe trials began afterward. They fell entirely on Camille and her daughter. Michael, on the other hand, remained on the sidelines and did not take any part in it. He became as if a stranger next to the people close to him. And this circumstance forced them to act in an emergency mode. They had to part with something, but they gained something. The truth, what happened next proved with extreme precision who and what they were. And one of them had to accept an unenviable fate as punishment for the unforgivable mistake he had made. After shedding her outer garments, Camille went into the kitchen and put the kettle on. I mean, I didn't feel like it. But to sip the aroma of another drink her soul demanded. There was such a fire inside that she could hardly breathe in her chest, as if with the discs of an ox, but not from fatigue. This state had nothing to do with today's busy day. On the contrary, after her daughter gave birth, she felt relieved and she didn't leave her until she got home. And already here a completely different set of emotions arose. They kind of signaled something important. It made you think and compare. And against this background, I drew not the most comforting general conclusions. And that was especially true of the relationship between her son-in-law and her daughter. From the moment Emily became pregnant, he had changed dramatically. If before that he spent all his free time with her, then soon he began to have unforeseen business trips. And not anywhere, but as far away from home as possible and most often in the same city. Emily loved her husband immensely and did not seem to notice the obvious things. And only her mother tormented herself with murky suspicions, but she could not express them because she was afraid of her daughter's anger. Besides, suspicions alone meant nothing. Michael could have had 100 reasons to go on a long business trip but the fact that he began to do it at regular intervals created those suspicions. They've been building up like a snowball, and they've been building up, and they've been building up to even more difficult thoughts. And in fact, some of them floated near the surface, such as the choice of interior design for the children's room. After all, Michael insisted on his own option, contrary to Emily's opinion, and did not even listen to her. Although she offered not the worst ideas, perhaps not so original, but not empty. From the outside, it would seem that he wasn't doing the upgrades for his son. Or he'd gone to the trouble of appearing to be a loving and caring husband. Either way, both versions and all could not be ruled out, because they could lead to the same sad denouement. Among other things, today's surprises about the baby's weight. He was not born skinny, and that, on the contrary, was to be rejoiced over. However, Michael said that he did not have such a stout child in his family. At the same time, he cleverly twisted his arm. When Emily began to demand explanations from him, I pressed on her pain points 
and she immediately melted. But then she pulled herself back together and came back to reality. And she was aided by her mother's genes. It wasn't easy to deceive. Only two people had ever managed to do it in their entire lives. And her husband wasn't one of them. He only showed character. Otherwise, he didn't even try to get away with it or look for false traces to deceive, only to end up being exposed. After drinking a couple mugs of soothing tea, she still couldn't sleep for a long time afterward. All the same thoughts that had overcome her during the day were in her head and kept her awake. There was a sense of falseness on the part of her son-in-law, but without any obvious signs. Such an impression, as if he skillfully managed to disguise all his secret steps. And they were not even out of the general background, as if they went in unison. At the same time, she saw no reason to relax. It was for her daughter to make a picture that everything was all right. But what was really going on in her soul? Emily was not yet to know. Right now, her condition required not only peace, but also an attitude of positive emotions. Knowing this, her mother remained neutral and did not make any sudden movements. In a sense, she even tried to present her son-in-law with a good side. But slightly miscalculated, because Emily was also not a finger maid and did not believe in the sincerity of her husband, who rejoiced at the birth of a hero. After all, he gave himself away. He doubted his paternity, though figuratively, and did not hurry to make it clear. Why did he suddenly have such thoughts? He could have asked his wife, Beloved, probably you had a family of bogaters? But he did not do that, which spoke of his partial indifference. Well, a big son was born, and that's fine. That's good too. No warm feelings though, on the other hand, it was pointless to speculate on that alone. And Camille understood that perfectly well, like two times two in math. The only thing she couldn't do was put the rebus together. As it was, but with different particles that sometimes didn't fit together at all. And it was necessary to find the key link, especially since it was somewhere very close, right at the surface, in plain sight like an eyesore. But there was no way to look at it from the outside. That's what worried Camille. She knew where to look, but she didn't have enough equipment. And to get them required certain steps. But Emily's mother could not dare to take them yet and waited for a convenient moment for her son-in-law to reveal himself. However, in the process of disclosure of fate intervened and without unnecessary effort, all put everything in its place. Michael soon after his arrival showed himself in all his glory and surprised not only his wife with this statement, but also those who trusted him without complaint, in fact, shocked his immediate environment, leaving them in complete bewilderment. In the morning, Camille woke up as if she had been broken. A hard night of heavy thinking had taken a toll on her overall health. She barely made it to the bathroom to wash her face and asked herself angrily, who makes you think so much? The question sounded hollow because she didn't know how to answer it yet. Surprisingly, she didn't even have any thoughts about it in her head. It was as if her brain had shut down and was still in hibernation. And to bring it back to its awake state, it was necessary to take a contrast shower first, and then drink a cup of coffee. Camille did just that, but it only partially helped. She remembered what her daughter had asked for closer to lunchtime, and prepared everything in a special container so that nothing would spill. There was broth and a plucky breast. From it came such a flavor that drool involuntarily flowed. She barely restrained herself from opening the container, but instead picked up a couple of sandwiches and skewered them hastily. All thoughts were of driving to her daughter's house and taking her to the hotel. On the way, she stopped by the store and bought juice and a pound of red apples. And with all this good stuff she rushed to the maternity hospital. However today she was not allowed into the ward, because there was another shift, and she had to pass the package through the duty nurse's post. However, Emily was able to go to the window and wave her hand. You could see that her daughter had recovered from yesterday, and didn't look so gloomy anymore most likely that she had realized and accepted the new reality during the previous night. Suddenly she pointed to a nearby window, and Camille realized that her daughter was about to open it. And in a few minutes, they were able to have a live conversation. Hey, how are you? Hi mom, I'm fine. And I calmed down. And Ethan doesn't get cranky as much. Have you fed him yet? Yeah, of course. Emily shrugged it off. He's sleeping now. I won't disturb him yet. 
By the way, the shift has changed, so you won't see me again until you're discharged, but we can talk on the phone if you need to. It's okay, I'll be fine. It's only a couple days, and you know it's easier for me to say that than to call. Okay, mom, thank you so much for the broth. I'm so hungry for your cooking. It's time for me to learn. Time is of the essence. She smiled and wagged her index finger at her. Who else would it be for? Michael can't stand the sight of me. I don't eat much. Emily replied with annoyance in her voice. And then the alarm bell sounded again. Camille tried to grasp its essence, but she failed. It was as if she had lost her ability to think logically. Everything in her head was jumbled and jumbled like a serialized reel, and she could hardly find the right words. It's never too late to learn. When your son grows up, you'll pass on your knowledge to him. You think he'll want to learn the basics of cooking. Why wouldn't he? Your father could cook, but I didn't let him because I wanted to take care of him. So that's why you were angry when he tried to bring you breakfast in bed in the morning. Emily laughed and wagged her index finger. And not only for that reason shook her mother's head, but also because she considered such an excessive display of tenderness be. But dad was still trying. Maybe Ethan was really like him. We had a handsome boy, we were big, it's not impossible. Daughter, especially since his mother, God rest her soul, said that he was a big boy when he was a child. That's the version I'm gonna give Michael. Emily smiled slyly. Don't let him say that we didn't have any heroes in our family. It's just a pity that it didn't help dad, and the disease still twisted him. That's the thing, that healthy people pass away, shook her mother's head. Are you going to the cottage today? Yes, I should take out the weeds and water the flowers. We're not doing anything else. We'll wait for Michael to come back from his business trip. Do you think he'll do it? Camille smiled ironically. Let him get used to it. Emily waved her hand, and I won't be able to help you yet. At least he'll be supportive. Nothing will happen to him. If you go to the cottage after work for a week or two, it's good for your health and good for the family. Well, we'll see. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, but I'm going to see my son. He'll wake up soon. Kiss me our bogator with a smile and loudly set the mother and sent her an air kiss. And everyone who was also socializing under the windows turned sharply in her direction. From such intense attention, Camille was a little embarrassed, but immediately realized why it happened and that they had no negative assumptions about the appearance of the child. She proudly said that he was born almost four kilograms. That's why we call him a bogator. Congratulations. It came from all directions, and Camille barely fought them off while they shook her hand. However, she appreciated such a reaction and concluded that there were no large children among the other women in labor. So they were surprised when they heard about the four kilograms, probably imagined a lump with rotten meters, and they were partly right. After all, Ethan did look well-fed with a baby. But on the other hand, it didn't cause any problems. He didn't pass on and ate equally with everyone else, behaved calmly, didn't throw tantrums, and gave his mother a chance for a full night's sleep. Emily was even lucky to have such a balanced child, and this despite the fact that she was a fiery person. In him closely intertwined genes of both parents and formed a unique image of an individual personality, hair and eye color. At first, Ethan adopted from his mother, but the external contour, face, lips and structure, cheekbones from his father, all of which made him a truly beautiful child, for whom Emily would have spared nothing. She fully realized her role as a mother and no longer worried about how she would raise her son on an intuitive level. Emily felt fully supported, but only not yet divided it among themselves and did not analyze from whom it comes more. And only after a while everything fell into place, the day of her husband's arrival was approaching, and Emily was visibly worried. She had already been informed about the discharge and prepared the necessary recommendations for the further care of the child. In addition, the day before Michael had sent a message in which she wrote that he would pick her up from the hospital himself. True, there were no bright smiley faces in it, and it said that her husband wrote this message without much enthusiasm. But at the same time, Emily did not go into details and demand explanations. She wanted with every fiber of her being to return home as soon as possible and finally feel herself in the native element near her loved ones. 
a little earlier. Half an hour before Michael arrived, her mother arrived. Camille was not allowed into the ward again, and while she was humbly waiting for her daughter, other happy fathers and relatives reached the special exit, and everyone was languidly waiting to see if they would be allowed to pick up their new moms. The head nurse and Camille came around the corner. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my brother-in-law's license plate. He pulled up not far from the entrance. When he got out, he had a modest bouquet of flowers in one hand and a black bag in the other, apparently a gentleman's kit for the medical staff. Basically, she hadn't noticed anything strange yet, and it was possible to assume that the son-in-law was really happy to meet his wife from the maternity hospital. But as soon as Michael approached her, he was immediately cold. Hello, Camille. Did you come here before me or have you been on duty since yesterday? Hello, Michael. She answered him with the same restraint. If they'd let me stay, I wouldn't have left here at all. But don't judge me. I didn't wait, by the way. I was making money. I'm sure you did. I see you're not in the mood, Michael summarized. Well, with your permission, I'll wait for my wife in silence. Camille made no reply, for just at that moment, Emily appeared at the door. She was carrying the baby in her arms, and she was glowing with happiness. She was assisted by the same nurse, Evelyn. But Emily seemed to be doing quite well without her. At least, she didn't fall or stagger. She had enough strength to move around normally. When Michael saw his wife, he smiled and almost confused who to give what to. Hello, my love. I'm so glad we're back together. Now it's our baby too, and hello, sweetheart. Emily interrupted him and handed him the baby in his arms. It's so beautiful, just like you. It's got yours in it. Don't worry. In fact, he's like two peas in a pod in his parents. Yeah, yeah, I just said the wrong thing. Michael got nervous and even blushed a little. Camille intervened, noticing the confusion on his son-in-law's face. Okay, I'll just be a minute. He quickly handed his son to his mother-in-law. It was as if the burden was burning his hands, and he could not feel at ease while he was holding his own son in front of him. Another alarm bell rang, but this time Kinmil did not pay any attention to it. Or rather, she didn't want to think about it on a day like this. After all, she was welcoming her daughter and grandson from the hospital. All other problems and questions were in the background. And even this situation with the transfer of the child was not an exception. Meanwhile, Emily also noticed how her husband too quickly agreed to give the child away. He could have been supportive. I could have unlocked the car myself. Maybe you don't even trust me with the keys anymore. What are you, my favorite? Of course I do. Michael replied with a tremor in his voice. It just seemed a little tired and not in the right state of mind to be fiddling with keys. I'm fine. Open up, Emily commanded, and taking the baby from the mother, she said softly, we opened their eyes. We're learning about the world around us. Look, he's trying to see where they took him. Camille said with a smile. Mom, but he can't see anything yet. Yes, I know, but it's still interesting. He's a great big guy. It makes your heart swoon to see such beauty. Why do you keep using that word? Michael grumbled unhappily, opening the cabin door in front of them. Yeah, from the fact that he was born big. Emily cut him off. You'll see when you're home drunk. All right, get in, let's go. Emily and the baby and her mother sat in the back seat and put small pillows in their laps. Michael had carried them with him just in case, so he could stop and pick them up on the road. Look in the rearview mirror. He made sure everything was in order and pulled out of the driveway. The car pulled smoothly out of the maternity hospital grounds and headed toward home. On the road, neither of them said a word, as if there was nothing to talk about. Even Camille was silent, though she had something to say and how to present it. But she decided not to stir things up. She had had enough of her son-in-law's greeting. He looked at her so haughtily, as if there was a gulf between them. And to cross it, it was necessary to build bridges in the form of status promotion. In other words, to rise to his level, to be able to talk on equal terms. But she was not going to do it, because she realized that her son-in-law would not appreciate it anyway and would look for new gaps to get even more distant. Having combined all these alarm bells, it was possible to come to the conclusion that Michael planned some meanness. But what exactly was going on in his head was still a mystery. Camille tried to catch the course of his thoughts, 
but he was constantly maneuvering. It was as if he felt that his mother-in-law was waiting for a convenient moment to catch him on some word. When they arrived home, they all went to the nursery together. There Emily laid her son on the bed and crucified him. Michael looked at him calmly and said indifferently, and I wouldn't say that the rich boy is just a well-fed child. You sound like you're upset. Emily replied unhappily. No, I just judged his complexion, shook my head, and in his eyes did not even light up fire. It usually happened at the moment of the first acquaintance with the child. And the new parents, whether father or mother directly begged for happiness and visibly worried, but not Michael. He was very calm, as if the son was not brought from the hospital and bought in a toy store on sale. About the same condition could be read on his face. And Emily, sensing her husband's indifference to her own child, muttered unhappily, it would be better to help with the tapes than to stand there. Well, I don't know how. Look how it is necessary and memorize. Might come in handy. In what way? Michael frowned. You're always at work. I'm confused with the baby. But it could happen that you're going to be overwhelmed. Yeah, well, you have to study. How about a celebratory dinner? Not tonight. Emily crossed her arms across her chest and made a sour face. What about you, Camille? He turned to his mother-in-law. I don't think we should celebrate today either. She shrugged. Let's do it sometime next weekend, just in time for the cottage. Water your flowers again. No one's forcing you. Mom can do it herself. Emily cut him off. Even though I told him at the hospital he'd be helping for at least a couple weeks. In general, as I understand it, today the holiday is cancelled. Just in case, I decided to check with Michael. Yes, the wife and mother-in-law answered in one voice. I see. Then we continue to learn how to swaddle. We bent over the baby. He began to change the tape together with his wife, and at the same time his mother-in-law was watching him. And she had already formed a definite opinion. What should she and her daughter expect in the future? She clearly imagined how her son-in-law would change in a month or sooner. Judging by the way he behaved now, it was safe to say that he was preparing for something unexpected. And soon it happened. Or rather, in a week. That's how long it took Michael to reveal his cards. Only he could not imagine what would be waiting for him in the future. He had counted on a pleasant and promising prospect. But in the end he fell to the bottom of life, and none of his friends felt sorry or lent a helping hand. After all, he had committed an act for which there was no justification at all. Not only that, he did not have the courage to ask for forgiveness from the closest people. He simply took and burned all the bridges. However, all this did not happen overnight, but over a period of time. Fate quietly sneaks up on him to send a boomerang in return. And he struck such a blow that overnight overturned all notions of good and evil. Michael found himself in a place he never expected. He'd never even dreamed of this world. He had only heard about it from his acquaintances, and even then the most superficial information. But when he was plunged there with his head, he howled and remembered everything he had done before. His brains did not turn off and gave out new images from the depths of his subconsciousness. One was scarier than the other, and it seemed that there was neither end nor edge. So much swam, and his soul with dirt and varnish, that he almost did not notice anything. It was only his mother-in-law who discerned his amorphousness, but too late to notify her daughter of it. Emily was caught in our usual debriefing when she was confronted with the fact, and in such a harsh form that she almost lost the gift of speech. She still had faith that her husband would not leave her and find another woman. But he did even worse and thereby signed a one-way ticket to normal surroundings, and he would not be able to get there for a long time, at least not without help. And when Michael bypassed the real prospect of further existence, he began to look at many things differently. But by that time the flywheel of the fateful boomerang had spun to its full speed and was not going to let him out of its orbit. After Emily showed her husband the process of the experience, he seemed to understand the basics and promised to keep practicing. Even assured everyone that he would be the best father ever. You'll see, just give it time, and soon you won't recognize me at all. You're careful with the changes, Emily. Ethan and I are really going to wonder who that uncle is living with us. That's a good one. I'll keep that in mind. Michael said snidely. 
What about you, Camille? Did your son-in-law learn to take over the child? Just the tops. But it's a simple matter. And even more ironically, she replied. We'll see how you behave when you have to stay with him all day. I hope it doesn't come to that. Honey, are you scared or something? No, I'm just a little worried. I shrugged. See, Mom, it's just normal excitement. Emily smiled. It takes time to get used to everything. You didn't know how to take care of a baby right away either. You must have had some guidance, right? What about it? Of course they scolded me, especially my mom. I remember her scolding me in front of the whole family. For the fact that the diapers did not swallow, so ashamed I was ready to fall through the ground. And there are many such cases I can remember. Let's not be sad. I'm going to cry, Michael begged. He looked at his wife and then at his mother-in-law. Are you serious or are you joking? Is he angry? Emily asked. Michael noticed the evil light in her eyes and out of sin answered in a low voice, I'm sorry, dear, it was a bad joke. And I understood everything and I won't interfere where I'm not asked anymore. That's not even the point. It's just that you're being ironic on purpose. It's like you're being spiteful. And don't tell me it's because you're in a good mood. I wasn't. You know that. That's it. Calm down. Camille intervened again. We don't need you two fighting. You haven't had time to pick up the baby yet. You're already fighting. Mom, we're not fighting. We're just prioritizing. Emily corrected her. Exactly. And all of a sudden you panic. Michael, like a fox putting in his five cents to justify himself to his mother-in-law. But she didn't even bat an eye. She just kept pushing her line. Your family is one more person. And it's time to get smart, put aside your liberties, and start living for a brighter future. So you're saying that before this, we had no future at all. In a disgruntled voice, Michael asked. Why not? There was something. But you are for yourself, and most of the time without any moral responsibility. Everything that happened between you, you perceived as ordinary things. And now it's time to look at life differently, and preferably from the other side. How do you do that, if it's no secret? It's very simple. You just have to compare your past, evaluate the future and form the present. And without any surprises, so that later you won't have to regret the aimlessly lived years. Do you know how to live mother-in-law, sometimes wise thoughts to squeeze out? Michael smiled, and I almost always do. You just don't notice it. And if nothing changes, I'll soon be nothing to you at all. What are you talking about, Camille? Yeah, mom's really not making a big deal out of it. Emily, we're supposed to be calming down, and you're just pouring oil on the fire. What am I doing? Outraged, she looked at her daughter. I'm sorry, Mom, it just slipped out, honestly. That's not what I meant to say. And if you think okay, I don't think anything. I really should get going, she shrugged. I'm just gonna kiss my grandson goodbye, and you can walk me out. Yeah, sure. Michael immediately jumped up from the couch and followed his mother-in-law. He realized that he had to show his hospitality at the end, so he took the baby in his arms to give it to his grandmother. Camille made a surprised face in response, but took the grandchild from him. And while the excited parents watched her, she spoke to him in a gentle voice. Why is his forehead wrinkled? We don't want to open our eyes. Well, you've tortured me. I want to sleep, and you're here with your guests. I can't get any peace from you. Mom, that's so sweet. You're such an angel, Emily said with tears in her eyes. He's the angel. He gets all the attention. She nodded at her grandson. Now for him we must try to live for him, not for ourselves. Yes, we understand. Well, that's good. Then I'm off. If you need anything, call me anytime I'll come and babysit. Emily took her son back from her and put him in his crib. Interestingly enough, he didn't even get cranky. That's what grandmother's hands meant when they were centered in calmness itself. She could easily calm any child and set him in a positive mood. Michael realized it at once, but he didn't appreciate it. Having seen off the grandmother, the couple cooked a light dinner, refusing from delicacies and even less alcohol. It turned out quite well, considering the fact that Ethan continued to sleep peacefully. It was only towards nightfall that he woke up. But then Emily arrived in time with a new submariner and immediately came to his chest to feed. 
In such a rhythm, a whole week flew by imperceptibly, and it would seem that one could conclude that everything got better, but no. One evening, when they were getting ready and tucking the baby in, Michael suddenly said, It's not much. There's nothing like me in him at all. What are you talking about? Emily almost shouted, but immediately covered her mouth with her hand and cried quietly. And look at you, as if you were someone else's child. Michael, stop talking nonsense. What about you? What's going on with you today? Nothing. I just took your mom's advice and decided to look at life from a different perspective. I answered you snidely. Well, here's the thing. I decided to listen to her for once. That jerked Emily's shoulders. So what came to your mind? Why don't you share? The child is mute. That's the conclusion I've come to. And don't even try to change my mind. I'm not going to. But in a month's time, you'll be the one apologizing. We'll see about that. Don't guess when you don't know what the future holds. What do you mean? A frown on your brow? Asked Emily. Then you'll see when the time comes. What could it mean? She didn't know yet, but she was wary. Her husband had suddenly changed, for the worse. And interestingly enough, her mother had said the same thing. So Emily decided to do a DNA test to prove her parentage. In addition, she made her mother aware of the incident and generally offered to move in with her. Emily, however, refused. We have to wait a little longer. Maybe he's temporarily losing his mind. Then he should be in a mental institution, not among normal people. Well, mom, why so extreme? Because very soon he'll pull some other stunt and before you know it, you'll be out on the street. I don't think it'll come to that. Besides, he apologized the next day. He was a little tentative, like he didn't feel guilty. So what, you two don't talk at all now? Only in the morning and at night, it's still a bit of a stigma. Emily shrugged, and Michael understands that. But he doesn't want to admit it and keeps pretending that nothing happened. See for yourself, but my heart feels that this is a preparation for something more serious, warned her mother. I hear you. Soon will be the results of the examination, and then he will definitely calm down. At that moment, Emily had no idea what her husband was preparing for her. He didn't just get excited about the parentage. He had to prepare the ground and draw a line under certain actions. However, his wife was bending his line, and this fact forced him to force events. Michael did not wait for a convenient moment, which according to his calculations, was to come in two months and struck a blow at the most unexpected moment. But before that time, he and she kind of even made up and agreed that there would be no disagreements between them. And just so there was no doubt about it, personally, Michael started acting like a model family man. Since then, it's been another week and things have kind of calmed down. But eventually he ran out of patience and had another fight with his wife. So the neighbors were pointing fingers at them the next morning. Emily cried all night. At the same time, she did not sleep well because her son was capricious. The husband with his loud screams drove everyone to a white fury and first of all the child. He even began to shudder, and this did not bode well. The mother again offered Emily to move in with her and leave Michael for a while. But she again refused. And when the results of the examination came back, she presented them to her husband. He read them carefully and haughtily said, I don't believe these papers. This is not my child. Yes, how can you say that? Emily was angry, and she almost threw a punch at him. I carried our baby for nine months. You've been waiting for it to arrive, and now here you are. You don't want to admit it, but forensics won't lie. It says in black and white that he's your own son. I don't know anything. We'll each have our own opinion. Michael wouldn't let it go. In fact, if you don't like it, you can pack your things and leave. So you're gonna kick me out. What about our baby? I don't see a problem. Take it with you. I don't want anyone else's. What are you talking about? Like a parrot? A stranger is a stranger. Emily begged and sobbed loudly. He's your child. And that's the end of it. It's good to draw a line, isn't it? Nodded Michael. Now you can mimic it from my apartment. I'll be gone. But you'll regret it and you'll remember me. But it'll be too late. Good riddance. And bring the baby. With tears in her eyes, Emily began to swaddle her son. Michael stood aside and smirked. 
At this moment, he did not even feel the approaching boomerang of fate, enjoying the humiliation and suffering of his wife. It seemed to amuse and amused him, and give him confidence that he was doing the right thing. While collecting her son, Emily suddenly remembered her mother's words about something serious, and realized that again she had let everything pass her ears, and believed in her husband's brothels and speeches. His whole rotten being was on the surface. It was only necessary to shake it harder, so that the outside would sleep. But she didn't, and now she wished for her own fruits of carelessness. There was a little money left in her purse, and that was enough for her to take a cab to her mother's. Naturally, Camille welcomed her daughter and grandson with open arms, but she also read moral lectures. I warned you that this wouldn't end well. I even suggested you move in with me, at least for a while. Mom, that wouldn't have worked for me. He's gone off the rails. It's like he's been waiting for the right moment. I thought so too. And I still think he had a cunning plan. Camille shook her head. What was that about? Emily asked calmly. She had finally stopped crying. Yes, and that it wasn't for Ethan that your Michael renovated the nursery. And in general, lately he's been behaving strangely trusting and almost dusting you off. And since my son was born, he's been all over the place. At first I thought it was just emotion from worry. And we even made up afterwards. But it's only been a week and it's happened again. I don't know what happened to him. Okay, I'm gonna take responsibility and tell it like it is. Your husband has another woman, and it's likely that she had a baby with him too. And he prepared this room for that child. I don't believe it. Mom, I don't believe it. Emily cried again, but this time from the realization that she had been told the real truth. After all, all signs converged, unexpected business trips, sudden spending of money, renovation of the children's room on her own initiative, and finally, the rejection of her own son. Calm down, daughter. What's to come is what's to go. I also at first believed in his sincerity, and then I began to suspect that he is not such a simple man. Slowly I looked closer, gathered information, analyzed and drew conclusions. She didn't tell me anything about it. Emily sighed heavily and looked at her with tearful eyes. I was afraid you'd misunderstand me and blame me for everything. My mother shrugged and cried too. And only now I realized that I should have told you everything at once. You wouldn't have had to go through all this and you wouldn't be crying in front of me now, but you would live in peace. What happened is what happened, Mom but I still don't believe he did it for another family. What do you think? We'll see. Emily stayed with her because she had nowhere else to go. But at the same time, she filed for divorce. Michael received the official notice, but he didn't respond to it. And that said he had completely lost interest in her and his son. They ceased to exist for him, literally and figuratively. And after some time, without waiting for an official divorce, Michael struck a decisive and final blow to his wife's ego. As expected, he was really preparing to accept a new family, and soon a woman came to him with a small daughter. What is interesting is that it was from the same city where he had been traveling lately, ostensibly on business. In fact, Michael lived with three families, and he liked the second one better. Apparently, this woman treated him in a special way. And if it was for her that he took this step, after his divorce from his first wife, his reputation had been dealt a significant blow. But Michael mistakenly thought things would get better. However, soon there were financial problems, and he called his wife to return the jewelry given to him. Surprisingly, Emily agreed and came to the park to hand over the jewelry box. Take it. I don't need anything from you. I'm only here for a while to straighten things out, he said guiltily, lowering his head later. I'll get it all back. You'll see. Just don't tell anyone about this. I won't. I'm no longer interested in your fate. Emily cried. You've completely forgotten about your son, haven't you? I no longer ask to visit. At least just call and find out how he's doing. I haven't had time. I've had some problems, but things will get better soon. And I'll visit you if you'll let me. I doubt that very much. But you can see your son. And that was the end of it. And it's amazing that after what he did to her, she showed him mercy. She even let him see her son. Although, if you think about it, she could have closed all the doors. Apparently, a piece of pity in her soul still remained, and she remembered him for a long time. 
but they never saw each other again. And a whole year flew by unnoticed. By that time, Emily had already gotten used to living without her husband. All the more so because there was always a caring and loving grandmother nearby. Together, they managed not only to educate Ethan, but also to provide him with everything he needed. Emily did not sit idly by and also worked part-time and brought a substantial income to the general budget. It was quite good and enough for all the necessary expenses. They even managed to save for a rainy day, but fate took care of them and warded off storm clouds. What couldn't be said about the former taker? He not only could not solve financial problems at the expense of his wife's jewelry, but also lost the last thing he had and above all the respect of close people. And his friends had stopped giving him a hand. And all because the boomerang of fate dropped him to the bottom of life. Michael couldn't cope with the oppressive pressure and fell into drunkenness. Naturally, his new wife left him and took his daughter. The apartment turned into a den and alcoholics from all over the neighborhood began to come there. He took a spare drink and sank to the bottom of life, lower and lower. He never even thought about the fact that he had a different life, for all the things he'd done. He had to answer bitterly and not only to be left without a family, but also to turn into an alcoholic. The boomerang of fate was so powerful that it left no chance for salvation. Even his neighbors, with whom he was once friends, did not lend him a helping hand. They simply shied away and pretended not to notice. Emily soon found out about it too, naturally from her mother, but she was unwilling to visit him. By saying such words, he had set himself up and gotten what he feared so much. Indeed, Michael mocked those who for one reason or another were above her life. And when he himself got there, he felt all the delights of a worthless existence on his own skin. And in this he could only blame himself, because he did not value what he had. His wife calmly adapted to the new life, and did not worry about how her ex-husband. She realized that all this time she tolerated indifference and deceit, and did not even suspect what kind of person Michael really was. The lamentable outcome of their life together was an invaluable experience for Emily, and she learned from it certain lessons. However, she decided not to tie herself to new family ties for the time being. Their son was fine as it was, especially since grandmother was helping, and new life horizons awaited them ahead.